welcome to the second annual to the to the second day of our third annual liver cancer conference the educated patient i hope you all had a great time yesterday and learned a lot of information from our presenters as well as the questions that came in through the chat Today, we're gonna to have a great presentation and we want everyone to know that this program is being delivered on the Zoom webinar platform and will be recorded. During today's presentations, if you have a question or comment, please hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and click on the chat feature. We will make every effort to ask all questions during the Q&A portion of the program. Again, please make note that this program is being recorded and will be available on ALS YouTube channel for future viewing. American Liver Foundation was founded over 46 years ago and is the nation's largest patient advocacy organization for individuals with liver disease. Each year, we engage over 5 million people through our robust education, support, and awareness initiatives. As part of our commitment to the liver community, ALF offers a range of educational programs for patients. And our mission is to promote education, support, and research for the prevention, treatment, and cure of liver disease. I wanted to say a special thank you to our planning committee for doing a phenomenal job curating this conference. Dr. Abu Alpha, Dr. Esrin, Dr. Guy, Dr. Taddy, Dr. Zarampar. This is their third year as the committee. And again, every year they put on a phenomenal conference. So wonderful job. An extra special thank you to all of our speakers. We cannot do this without them. The information that they provided has been invaluable. Thank you to our sponsors for their dedication, commitment, and support of this program. Our presenting sponsor, Exelixis, premier sponsors, Asai and Genetech, clinical trial sponsor, Eureka Therapeutics, and our partner, Bristol Myers Squibb. And now we will hear from our presenting sponsor. When I think back on the last 25 years for the company, the learnings are deep and somewhat profound. We've done it our way. This is a hard business, but it's a really great business to be in when you've got the right team and the right mindset to go off and really attack some of the hardest problems in biomedical research. I think for most of us, when we start a company in the biomedical space, the objective is fairly narrow. We just want to solve a scientific problem. Hopefully the solution to that problem may lead to a drug. From everything from access to government affairs to all touch points in the organization, the patient is at the focus. Patients aren't only front and center in what we do, but Exelixis also works with a variety of patient advocacy organizations who work with us to create a united front in good public health policy. As every aspect of the organization evolves, how do we have the vision to create the next wave of clinical studies that will help address those patients' needs, even as better therapies come onto the market? Thank you. Now we will have a quick exercise, about five to seven minute exercise. And I think that this is something that we heard from some patients over the last year, talking about stress and how they can't relax and just needing a few exercises. And so we're looking forward to having Tracy vote. Tracy was a professional dancer at Philadelphia, Philadelphia Dance Company for over 12 years, along with other contemporary modern dance companies. She started dancing at the age of three and has made a lifelong career and habit of sharing her knowledge and training with young dancers. Tracy is currently finishing her master's degree in dance through Hollins University and is also the rehearsal director of Philadelphia. Tracy is the director of contemporary dance at String Theory School. And she has completed workshops in trauma-based yoga and has completed her yoga teaching training. She hopes to share her own experiences with health, breath, and physical well-being with the group. Welcome, Tracy. 
I'm looking forward to learning how to stretch properly and breathe. Um, <laughs> thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day here in Philadelphia. It's nice, bright, and sunny. Um, so we're going to kind of take that sun and kind of turn it into our breathing. So I'm going to ask you to kind of sit in your chairs and have your feet grounded into the floor, a strong posture, but not a tense posture. And maybe gently close your eyes or, or bring your focus inward. Um, think of yourself as a mountain, solid, stable, serene. Thinking of the splendor of nature. Imagine sun shining on your skin. If thoughts come to your mind, allow them to drift away like clouds. Now we're gonna take a deep breath in for four counts. So we're gonna breathe in through our nose. One, two, three, four. And breathing out for five counts through our mouths. One, two, three, four, five. One more time, breathing in. And the exhale just a little bit longer than the inhale. So using your breath as an anchor. I often find that young dancers and young students and professional dancers lose their breath, but always coming back to that breath. So just noticing your breath and how the body rises as you inhale and how the body exhales and releases. Try to melt the tension between your eyes and your face. Notice the tension in your jaw. Try to release that with your breath. Breathing into your whole body. Imagining that breath brings space. The body loves to gain space. Space in our minds, space in our bodies. The mind and body are one. We're gonna help the body and mind to be quiet and still. Calming your thoughts. Quiet the noisy thoughts. Go back to the beautiful, serene nature themes. Thoughts should come and go and just be an impartial observer of those thoughts. As if clouds are floating in and drifting away. Notice your thoughts and acknowledge them, but try not to judge them. Try to let go of the judgment with your inhale and your exhale. And now we're just gonna kind of do a few stretches using your breath. You're gonna inhale and tilting your head to the right your ear gently dropping towards your shoulder. And inhale, lift it back up. And then repeating to the other side, ear dropping to the side. And gently coming back up. And then dropping the chin down towards the chest. Letting everything drop down. And inhale, lifting the chin up to the sky. And inhale, lifting up. This time you can add the hand, grabbing the opposite ear, dropping the head to the side. Letting the shoulder drift away. And then switching it out. Other hand, drop the shoulders down, ear dropping towards the shoulder. And then gently bringing your head center, taking your hands behind your head and just tucking the head, head down towards your chest. A little gentle pressure with your hands. And then inhale, coming up, kind of taking your hands under your chin and lifting the chin towards the sky. And coming back to center. And doing a little half moon, letting your ear drop and circle to the opposite shoulder. And then come up and then reversing, dropping the ear to the shoulder, rounding forward like a half moon. And coming up. 
And then easy, just lift the shoulders and then drop them down. Lifting the shoulders way up as much as you can and dropping them down in your back. And maybe try gentle shoulders, circles, drop lifting and dropping backwards. And then reversing, lifting the shoulders and dropping them forward. Gentle, using your breath with your body. And then bringing your hands to your lap. Just kind of doing a gentle cat and cow. So you can just round the body down. And then inhale, you're going to lift the body up and arching the back like a cow. And rounding your back like a cat. And inhale, arching the body. And then coming back to normal, neutral. Inhale, lifting the arms up way up above the head and just clasp the hands and press up. And maybe do a little side stretch, inhaling and feeling the parts of your side body, waking those up. And then gently dropping the body over the legs, let your body hang down to the floor, inhaling and exhaling. Letting the tension drift away. And walking your hands up your legs, come back to your seated position. And bringing one, arm to, one hand to the opposite side of you. Take your arm up and reach way over side. And inhale and drop the arm. Taking the other arm to the opposite side of the body. Inhale, lift the arm. And gently feeling the side of the body stretching. And lifting up. And now maybe using your chair, twisting the body. Twisting the body. So using the back of the chair to help gently twist. Think of this as almost a rinsing, a twisting, a cleansing. Other side, inhaling. And exhaling. And maybe stretch your legs out in front of you. And inhale, lift the arms up. And again, gently just dropping over your legs, letting your body hang. Letting the weight drop to the floor. And then gently walk the hands up the legs. And if you can, gently lifting one knee in your hands, just lifting gently, and maybe just circle your foot. Circling the ankle, increasing that circulation, and maybe the opposite direction. And then lower that foot to the ground. The other foot, other knee up, just circling the ankle. Again, connecting to your breath, gentle circles. And then lowering back down. And one more inhale, lift up. And bringing your hands down to your heart center. And just trying to find more time to connect to our breath, keeping simple. Thank you so much. I hope you have a beautiful conference. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tracy. I feel so relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> that was sponsored by Phil Banco, the Philadelphia Dance Company. And we wanted to make sure you all had an opportunity to um, begin this conference today, relax and ready to take everything in. We will now provide a we will now provide a video from one of our sponsors. Yesterday, cancer care offered few answers and less hope, one size treatments that never fit all. But today, we know every person with cancer has their own story, and each unique story powers us to turn science 
into breakthroughs, discovering new medicines, and personalizing cancer care for all patients. For more types of cancer than ever before, reaching more people than ever before, with hope and help. And we don't do this alone. We embrace partnerships to multiply the power and impact of innovation. Sometimes we'll stumble. The science may not always go as planned, but we'll stay the course until every cancer story has a better ending. Because a cancer-free tomorrow starts here. Before we introduce our first presenter, we'd like to present a poll. And our poll question is, do you know all of the members on your medical team? Let us know, do you know all the members on your medical team? Okay, 50-50. Um, so that is great to know. Um, as we go into the presentation by Dr. Esrin, she'll teach us a little bit about knowing your team and what we should know. Dr. Esrin is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Rush University Medical Center. She graduated from the University of Missouri at Kansas City School of Medicine and subsequently completed her residency in internal medicine at Maine Medical Center. She completed a transplant fellowship at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, followed by fellowships in gastroenterology and hepatology at Loyola University Medical Center. Her research interests include HCC, psychosocial aspects of liver transplantation, substance abuse, and alcoholic liver disease. She is also one of our members of the planning com committee. Welcome, Dr. Thank you, Ivory, very much. And I feel nice and relaxed, Tracy, from my stretching exercises, so thank you. Um, and thanks for the opportunity for allowing me to speak with you today. I'm glad that you put up the poll. I think that's a great representation of you know, why we're having this discussion today about uh, getting to know your team. So I'm really happy to present this segment. Um, this is a, a time where we can remove some of the mystery behind what happens behind the scenes and uh, sort of um, outline who makes up your team through your liver cancer journey so that it, you know what to expect a little bit more. There's less anxiety related to the, those individuals that you meet and it can, um, you can get the most out of uh, your experience um, going through your diagnosis and management of liver cancer. So who is your team? Well, in addition to your family and friends, your healthcare team is a group of providers with special skills to help manage your liver cancer with you. You've heard from or will hear from many examples of your team. Uh, these can be doctors, advanced practitioners, which are nurse practitioners and uh, physician assistants. They might be um, nurses, registered nurses, dietitians, social workers, mental health providers, pharmacists. So these are the individuals that make up your team. For this segment, I really want to emphasize the importance of the fact that there are multiple disciplines coming together for you in the management of your liver cancer. And this term is called the multidisciplinary team, multiple disciplines. And it's been highlighted through other presentations yesterday and today that the fact that there is the liver cancer is special in that it typically occurs in the background of cirrhosis, which is scarring of the liver. So the liver health is really important and that's managed by a hepatologist, a liver specialist like myself and Thankfully, there are many treatment options for liver cancer, 
and those are provided by an interventional radiologist, a surgeon, a radiation oncologist, and a medical oncologist. So it makes sense that a patient, an individual with liver cancer really needs a team made up of multiple special specialties. So I'm going to share my, I, I just have a few slides because I don't want, I really want to just have a conversation to go over everything, but um, I do want, I did want to give, um, and I give you an idea of what your team might look like um, when we meet together to, again, remove some of the mystery. So um, I'm just going to ask and make sure if you can see my slides. We can. Wonderful. Thank you. So I, I wanted to show this picture because it was, shows you how many people are involved in your cancer care behind the scenes. You might not see each of these members, but you should know that they are here for you. So this team of providers co typically comes together in a room or virtually um, to discuss your case. We review blood tests, your imaging, your history, medical history. Together, we discuss this. And then we meet with the patient and the family to determine the stage of the cancer, the liver function, and to discuss different treatment options. And I will say one advantage of the COVID era is that we all have a lot more comfortable, um, a lot more comfort with the virtual collaboration. And even in remote areas, there are pathways to involve these multiple disciplines, even from far away. So that I think is one advantage, if there are any of the COVID era, is that um, we all meet as a team with multidisciplines and there can be people that meet with us remotely. You should expect from your team involvement and input from multiple disciplines. You should expect good communication and you should expect and access to a point person that can help navigate through this process with you. That is what you should expect from your team. So much of the um, rest of the, my presentation is really gonna focus on this slide. So you can get to know your multidisciplinary team. I'm going to describe the roles of the subspecialties and mention the types of conversations that we might have in our conference, in our meeting to answer those questions of what is the stage of cancer? What are the treatment options and how can we optimize cancer care? Um, so other than you in the middle, um, the nurse or advanced practitioner is really the most important person on your team. Um, they are your point person to help navigate through the sometimes overwhelming journey. They would coordinate appointments, get records, um, and they really should be only a phone call or an email away. And they're also the person to gain access to those other providers or other um, members of the team such as um, a social worker, a financial expert, dietitian, mental health provider, clinical coordinator. We talked about clinical um, trials yesterday, um, a pharmacist or, or complementary medicine, uh, such as acupuncture, um, meditation, those types of things. Um, typically, a uh, nurse or the, uh, the nurse coordinator can um, provide access to those uh, other services. On the bottom is a hepatologist like myself as a liver specialist. Um, we see patients and not just liver cancer patients, but all patients with chronic liver disease. Um, 
those patients with chronic liver disease like cirrhosis are at risk for liver cancer. So one of my most important roles is to educate and screen patients for liver cancer so that we can detect the uh, cancer at early stages. But if we do have a diagnosis of liver cancer, a hepatologist will assess the liver function with blood tests, an examination, maybe an endoscopy, which is a scope test to look in the food pipe. Um, and this information helps inform the rest of the team uh, what the individual and the liver can tolerate in terms of treatment. Um, and then a hepatologist would see a, a patient with liver cancer regularly during treatment to continue to assess how well the patient and the liver are tolerating the, the treatment. And that would be anywhere from two to four to six weeks on treatment. So a hepatologist, I'm here to support and support the liver and then maximize liver uh, function during cancer treatment. On your team, you have two types of radiologists. One type of radiologist is a diagnostic radiologist. This is an expert in reading and CAT, the CAT scans and MRIs that you get. It's really important to have a accurate diagnosis and an accurate staging of the cancer. And um, these radiologists are very skilled in reading the scans and really um, ensuring that they think that it's a quality image. Um, so sometimes you might have be asked to have uh, additional MRIs or CAT scan. It's really because we want to get the best uh, picture and so we can give have the most information to be the most accurate. And during your cancer treatment, um, the diagnostic radiologist will help read the follow-up scans to make sure that the cancer is controlled or determine if there's a recurrence. The other type of radiologist is an interventional radiologist. Um, they help us and help you um, determine whether or not the liver-directed therapies are options. These would be the TACE, the TEARS, the ablations that you've heard of, heard about during these uh, during this conference. Um, we th their input um, would determine whether or not these procedures would be an option based on the size, the number of um, the tumors, and the underlying liver function. And uh, with them. Um, we monitor um, how patients respond to those, um, those treatments and that, um, again, we would see if there is a, a recurrence of the cancer and whether or not another procedure like that needs to be performed. Um, next, we have the surgeon on the bottom right. Um, a surgeon uh, who we'll hear from um, it gives us the most uh, input about whether or not surgery or resection is an option to remove just that part of the liver or if a patient is a, a transplant candidate. Again, they would help us determine those things based on the size, the location, the anatomy of the liver, also the performance status or how well someone uh, can do their daily activities and the, based on their other medical problems and laboratory testing. So. Um, the types of conversations we would have with the surgeon during that conference of the picture you saw would be, you know, how can we get this person to transplant or how can we get this person to, to surgery? How can we optimize other parts of their medical conditions that they might be a candidate for those things? So again, it's a discussion amongst the, all the providers and the, the team to see what types of options you have. Um, next is uh, a medical oncologist. We heard from Dr. Abu Afla yesterday, and uh, the medical oncologists determine whether or not um, there is a uh, treatment option um, for um, systemic chemotherapy, and those could be pills or IV chemotherapy, and that depends, again, on the liver function, the stage of the cancer, and discussing the side effect profiles. Um, and what other symptoms the individual might have. Is that the, the right option? And then we have a radiation oncologist. There's systemic, um, I mean, sorry, external beam radiation that can sometimes be considered for liver cancer. And that can also be considered uh, in conjunction with some of the other therapies too. So uh, 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 radiation plus uh, in interventional radiology procedure. So these types are, these are the types of things that are, are discussed during the meeting. Um, 
not always, but sometimes a palliative care representative is in the meeting. Um, and this would be helpful for symptom management and, and also family support as needed. And then a pathologist is often involved in the conference because we look at the um, tissue under the microscope if a biopsy is performed and that can sometimes inform how aggressive the tumor is. Um, and also if a patient does have a liver transplant, we look at the um, liver that comes out under the microscope to see what the likelihood is that the cancer might return. So this is your team. This, these are all the people that are here for you. And we know that the um, multidisciplinary team, uh, based on research and experience, really improves communication. It improves um, patient reported symptoms, such as anxiety and depression. Um, and when you know you have a team that is working in your best interest and there's good communication and you feel like you have all the um, opportunities for treatment options, patients have a much um, more satisfactory experience through their journey. Um, and because this multidisciplinary team improves um, communication and uh, efficiency, because we're all in the same room, it therefore improves survival. So research you know, has shown that. So um, we are here for you. Your team is here for you. And our goals are your goals. I hope I gave you an idea of um, sort of what happens behind the scenes, um, who, is, who is your team, and the fact that um, we're here for you um, and we should only be a phone call away. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm looking forward to the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Sheila. That was great information, very informative. We will now hear from Dr. Zarenpar. Dr. Zarenpar is an associate professor in the Division of Transplantation at the University of Florida College of Medicine. Dr. Zarenpar earned his medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco, where he also obtained a doctorate degree in biochemistry. He completed a general surgery residency and a fellowship from the University of California, Los Angeles and he is a diplomat in general surgery through the American Board of Surgery and a fellow at the, of the American College of Surgeons and a fellow of the American Society of Transplantation. Welcome. Thank you, Ivory. Um, thanks everyone, good morning. Uh, it's still morning, uh, so um, just wanted to say hello and, and it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you all. Um, you know, I'm going to use slides, but I'm going to really keep this relatively informal. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them uh, in the uh, Q&A session. Uh, let me go ahead and switch over. Um, and I think you're able to see my slides. So I uh, <laughs> just wanted to kind of go over, you know, what it is. Yeah, Dr. Aswarn talked about, you know, what the, what the multidisciplinary team does. Um, and I wanted to show you from a surgeon's perspective, how important that multidisciplinary discussion is. And even you know, from one of the members of the team, how we really rely on the assessment of everyone else. Um, so the things that I'll be talking about in terms of, of surgery for liver tumors are you know, just kind of go over why it is that we cut parts of the liver out or the whole liver out what we do before the operation, um, some things about what we do during the operation and some of the new developments. In terms of what we do uh, or who we operate on or what we operate for, really um, the, the reason to cut parts of the liver out is that if there's anything in the liver that's not clearly benign, we really need to think that it's malignant, especially in people who have a predisposition to liver cancer who are getting screened, we get more suspicious. Now, the most common tumor in the liver that is not coming from outside the liver is hepatocellular carcinoma. But there are also more rare tumors like tumors of the bile, uh, of the bile duct or the gallbladder. And you know, the other reasons that we actually cut parts of the liver out is if there are tumors that came out from outside of the liver. And there are very specific um, questions that we have to ask about those patients with colon cancer metastases or, or other kinds of tumors. And I'm not going to get into that right now. Other reasons that we cut 
you know, we operate on the liver if there is benign disease that's really causing symptoms, but only if it's causing symptoms or if it's there's, you know, some concern for cancer, like, you know, the rare cases where a benign thing can actually be concerning for cancer. Uh, some of the other benign reasons we uh, operate on the liver would be things like adenomas, uh, some of which, depending on their size or their characteristics, can either rupture and bleed or develop into tumors. But really, um, you know, I'm going to skip through a lot of that stuff because we're talking about liver cancer and talk about when I see someone in my clinic or we discuss someone at a tumor board for surgery or for any, for any kind of liver cancer, what we think about before operating on them. So most importantly is, uh, you know, how are they medically? You know, what are their medical comorbidities? How are their hearts and lungs and general liver function? Um, you know, how bad is their liver disease? You know, and, and if there are questions about that, we really rely on our hepatologists as well as our interventional radiologists to give us an idea of that. You know, sometimes we'll do a biopsy. Sometimes we'll just, you know, a scan is enough. Um, certainly labs are going to be part of it. And in some cases, you know, we actually do functional, functional tests. The other thing that the surgeon uh, does with the help of radiologists is, you know, where is the tumor? Is it very central? Is it right on the blood vessels? How clean are the margins going to be when we cut it out? What, what is our expected margin? How much liver is going to be left over as we cut it out? And sometimes it actually takes uh, sticking a laparoscope in the abdomen to get an idea of these things because, you know, where although everything is getting much, much better, you know, sometimes there is uh, there's a need for actual sort of eyes on the liver itself or eyes on the rest of the of the abdomen. So who do we not uh, who do we decide not to operate on? Well, if they have severe functional liver disease, so child class C um, patients, you know, this is kind of a classification that's based on how functionally ill patients are based on their bilirubins and their ascites and their nutritional status and their coagulopathy, that's going to be an important thing. Um, as well as, you know, how much liver is going to be left over, how much, you know, medical comorbidities they have. And there's this score called the MELD score that's based on labs that we look at. And so it's a balance between how much liver we're going to take and how much liver or how much liver and, and total sort of disease they have. The more liver we take, the less comorbidities they can have. Um, in patients with normal, totally normal livers, we can leave up to, uh, you know, we can leave down to 20% of the liver. We can take four, four fifths of the liver if the liver is totally normal. Now, it's very rare that a liver that is totally normal has HCC in it. So a lot of times the, the patients will have fatty liver or uh, more cirrhosis or fibrosis, in which case we can take less and less. There are some things that we can do um, if there are, uh, if there are issues with, um, with the uh, liver, uh, just in terms of, you know, if there's too little volume left over, we can get what's called hypertrophy. So we can make the part of the liver that's going to stay get bigger. And I'll get into that a little bit. So other things that we would get, we would actually do a liver biopsy. If there was a question, sometimes we'll do functional measurements. We'll definitely check a MELD score because a higher MELD leads to poor outcomes. We look at the general status of the patient. We look at the tumor. So, you know, Big tumors, rupture tumors are still okay for resection, um, meaning that, uh, you know, they're not, they're not acceptable for transplantation because we worry about recurrence after transplantation on immunosuppression. But I think with a resection, we're still more likely to consider that. And then there are cases in which the tumor is associated with, a, with what's called a tumor thrombus, so tumor actually being in the large blood vessels. So if the, there's tumor in the blood vessels, you know, that's not uh, acceptable for, for liver transplantation because that's associated with super high recurrence rates after a liver transplantation. But if we can cut it out and, and include the vessel that has the tumor in it, there, it's possible to get favorable results. So how do we figure those things out? Well, um, we do CAT scans or we do MRIs. And what that helps us to do is to get an idea of where the tumors are, what the blood vessel status is and whatnot. So this uh, basically what happens when either the tumor is too big or the remaining liver is gonna to be too small. Well, so in patients who don't have enough liver volume, 
uh, that would be left over, what we can do is have our radiologists do what's called a portal vein embolization. So getting, uh, getting them to basically stick a needle in and put a coil into the part of the liver that's going to come out. Well, what that does is it cuts the blood flow to that part of the liver. It increases the blood flow to the part of the liver that's going to stay. And that liver, that part of the liver that's going to stay gets bigger. And, you know, not only does that mean that you have more liver after the operation, but it's also kind of like a pretest. If the liver is good enough to grow with a PVE, with a portal vein embolization, it means that that liver can tolerate an operation. Um, a little bit more, you know, recently what we've been doing is that we've also been doing this Y90 uh, embolization. So these are radioactive beads that get put in um, instead of the just the coils that get, get put into the blood vessels. So not only um, are, is the tumor being treated, but the area around the liver is getting treated. So it kind of gives the same effect in terms of getting the uh, part of the liver that's going to stay bigger. Um, People, you know, often ask me, you know, just a little bit more details about the surgery, what we actually do. So I'm going to go over some of the operative principles, um, but, you know, this isn't uh, to actually go over the specific details of it. So what, what's the treatment goal with any kind of surgery in liver cancer? Well, the goal is to remove all of the tumor cells and get clean margins, right? That's goal one. S parallel, though, is goal two, which is we need to leave as much liver as we can so that the liver that's staying there will function and to minimize any kind of liver failure risk after that. And of course, overall, everyone, you know, the ultimate goal is to prolong life and to increase the quality of life. Uh, to get to that, you know, what we like to do is do what's called an anatomic resection. So maybe a small tumor, but really coring it out isn't the answer because if we actually remove the anatomic section with the blood vessels going in and out of it, uh, it's been shown to improve uh, improve long-term results. But that said, um, it doesn't really matter how big the margins are as long as the margins are negative. Now, with some unclear uh, tumors, for some central tumors, bigger margins are better because, as I'll get to a little bit later, you know, the liver cancer uh, is one of those things where just because we cut a tumor out doesn't mean that other parts of the liver won't develop tumors. So this is kind of a, this is a question. So, and then people will ask me, well, you know, um, on, on the one hand, when I decide, or when the team decides liver transplants, the answer, um, you know, why transplant and not cutting it out and vice versa. And so we'll go over some of the arguments for and against liver resection versus uh, liver transplant. So what about, why would we not want to do surgery in terms of cutting part of the liver out. Well, so what it does is that cutting part of the liver out takes care of the tumor that we see in that area. That's basically what we call the local control of that tumor. The problem though, is that most of the time it's the entire liver that's the problem. So the entire liver is, is, a, you know, is affected by whatever disease it is that's causing the cancer in the, in the first place. Now, um, in, the, in the era before all these great hep C drugs, when we cut out, just cut out tumors in patients with hep C, up to 90% of patients had a another tumor somewhere else in the liver. We're not talking about a margin that wasn't clear. We're talking about somewhere else in the liver within five years. So the liver is the problem, not the tumor. And, um, you know, there are also cases when we decide not to cut the liver out or transplant where non-surgical methods have the same survival, meaning that, um, you know, there may be increased local recurrence, but, you know, in patients who are really sick, uh, the, the morbidity mortality overall can actually be lower with an ablation or a Y90 or some other thing like, or, or radiate, you know, radiation or something like that. Because, you know, ultimately the survival depends on the underlying liver disease, not necessarily the specific tumor. And who are some other patients that we can't operate on? Well, unfortunately, of the patients that we all see for the first time with liver cancer, more than 70% of them can't have an operation. It's because either they have tumor outside the liver or they have multiple tumors in both sides of the liver, or the bile ducts are involved uh, very centrally, or there is tumor in the big veins. So this is, you know, this is why screening is important. This is why anyone with cirrhosis needs to be screened 
This is why it's a team, uh, you know, it's a team involvement here. Um, and so, you know, we try, you know, the best, the best uh, offense is a good defense, right? So preventing people from developing cancer is the best. And so why does that push us towards doing transplantation? Well, transplantation is potentially curative, not just for HCC, but the underlying liver disease. And for anyone who has decompensated cirrhosis, it's the best treatment option. So it's recommended for people who are within what's called the Milan criteria. And the Milan criteria is what you'll hear about a lot in terms of the size and number of tumors and whether you know, transplantation is recommended or not recommended. So the Milan criteria means if you have liver cancer um, and it's one tumor, that one tumor can't be bigger than five centimeters, so about two inches in diameter. If you have more than one, you can have up to three but none of them can be bigger than three centimeters. And you can't have any disease outside of the liver, any cancer outside of the liver, and no major blood vessels can be involved. Now, it's possible to, you know, if you start outside those criteria to get you within criteria with either ablation or with Y90 or with external beam or whatnot, as long as at some point you get inside the criteria and you stay within those criteria, then transplantation becomes an option. And patients do very well. Five-year survival with transplantation, you know, given these is really good. Now I put 75% here. It's probably a little, you know, even a little bit higher than that. And tumor recurrence rates are very, very low. So this is great. Um, so, you know, I told you this transplantation is great. Now, why would you not want to transplant some people? Well, there are some people who have liver cancer who don't actually end up having liver disease that is really bad. Um, and so that's what, that would be the treatment of choice because why is that? Well, transplantation is a whole thing, right? And, and, and you'll have to be on immunosuppression for the rest of your life. And, you know, it's a bigger risk operation than cutting a part of the liver out. And so in these patients um, who don't need a liver transplant, it's not indicated. And then there are patients um, that, you know, they're larger, so they can't, we can't get them within, to within criteria. And there's a problem with them with like injecting them or ablating them. And so, um, you know, we, we can't transplant those patients, but um, we can uh, operate on them. And then there are some older patients that are not transplant candidates because they have comorbidities that are too much for liver transplantation, but not for liver resection or liver, you know, cutting that part of the tumor out. And then, of course, there's the limitations that we're left with in terms of organ availability. So that becomes a major issue. Um, for, you know, uh, patients who have multifocal tumors um, never really are candidates for liver resection because we can't ever cut enough of the liver out without transplanting it. But uh, when there are, you know, when the tumors are too big for transplant, they're not necessarily too big for liver resection. Vascular invasion, I told you, if there are tumors in the big blood vessels, um, transplantation is not an option because of the recurrence rate. But resection, you know, um, I think that that's certainly a possibility uh, because you don't have to be on immunosuppression. You know, one of the reasons would be because you don't have to be on immunosuppression for the rest of your life. Um, and immunosuppression increases, uh, you know, cancer growth. Um, so what are the, what's, you know, what are our, or our, what do we do? What are the op surgical options? Well, we start with, um, you know, what, what's our approach? Well, we start generally, most surgeons start with putting a, a camera in the abdomen just to make sure there are no surprises. Then we look around the abdomen. We do an ultrasound of the liver, um, to make sure that the tumor is what we think it is. Um, I always use what's called perfusion imaging, um, just to uh, get an idea of the blood flow to the liver, um, of the anatomy, uh, as well as where the tumor is. And I'll show you some pictures as to what that means. Evaluate the cirrhosis and the, and the anatomy. And, and if there is any evidence of uh, disease outside or anything looks funny outside the liver, we'll biopsy those. And then what's the sort of the spectrum of uh, operations that we do? Uh, we do what's called a wedge resection, so just a small resection. Um, if it's a very, you know, on, hanging out on the edge kind of tumor, a small tumor, we'll do a segmentectomy. So liver has, um, you know, depending on who you ask, eight or nine segments, we'll just remove one of them. 
or we cut out either the right side or the left side or a little bit more than the right side or a little bit more than the left side. Uh, sometimes these are there are tumors that are kind of uh, stuck in the middle or, or smack dab in the middle. So we'll have to do what's called a parenchymal sparing, like a middle hepatectomy. And very, very, very rarely um, uh, with someone who uh, is at a transplant center, who, you know, who's got a lot of experience with these things, we can actually cut the whole liver out, do the resection while um, the liver is outside the body and then sew it back in. So this is kind of like what a left hepatectomy looks like. You see the arrow as to where the left side comes out. Um, you know, we'll cut through the liver and, you know, this is what the liver actually will look like as, as we split through it. Uh, this uh, right hepatect, I'm sorry, again, a left hepatectomy and this, you know, what would be left, um, this is the right side of the liver. So that would be what would remain after the left side comes out. Uh, this is a, you know, a more central tumor, right? It sits right in the middle of the liver. So in this case, uh, what we like to do is to do what's called a parenchymal sparing or a middle hepatectomy. And so you'll see the tumor is out and you know the middle uh, is out, and, but we've left the, the left and the right side in there with the blood vessels still intact. A right hepatectomy um, is basically the other side, the, the opposite. And, you know, we can, we can take tumors that are pretty big out with resection as long as the rest of the liver is okay. Uh, a lot of times we'll be able to do laparoscopic or robotic operations. Um, and so obviously you'll need to go to someone who has a lot of experience doing laparoscopic uh, liver resections. And then um, we talked a little bit about, you know, extending what our surgical resection abilities are. So we'll use portal vein embolization that we talked about. It makes the part of the liver that's going to stay bigger. And, um, you know, it actually really helps with resectability. It increases the chances. And, um, you know, sometimes we'll, there is evidence that giving chemo before liver resection or before transplantation will actually get people to within criteria. I'm not really going to talk about some of the more advanced uh, liver resection techniques, um, but you may hear about those in terms of like ALPS or an XVO that I kind of alluded to earlier on. Um, more about uh, chemo or Y90, right? Uh, take a tumor that's really very big and give either chemo or what's called transarterial chemoembolization. Um, so getting chemo directly to the tumor or getting radiation directly to the tumor that not only shrinks the tumor, but helps the other side get bigger. Um, and so we can do that before resecting it. And um, when, you know, what, what to expect after liver uh, surgery. So um, everyone has some sort of morbidity, right? Whether it's a, what's called a, a pleural effusion. So it's kind of a reactive collection of fluid in the chest um, after liver resection, you know, big liver resections, we have to peel the liver off the diaphragm. And so the other side of the diaphragm gets irritated and, and fluid collects. Uh, people can develop pneumonias because of the big, uh, big resections and you can't really clear your lungs very well. Uh, up to 10% of people have some sort of bile leak. Uh, depending on your surgeon and on your surgery, uh, you may have a, a drain put in to detect those bile leaks and try to fix those bile leaks before it uh, you know, gets problematic. Very, very rarely, less than 2% of the time, uh, there is risk of liver failure, which means you know, the INR, so the coagulation gets worse, the bilirubin goes up. And of course, there's always a risk of, of tumor recurrence. Uh, mortality is very, very low in terms of uh, liver resection. And it's very related to age and liver disease and other kinds of diseases, uh, whether it's kidney, pulmonary, you know, lung, or, or heart disease. Um, but you know, I, I think that what we really need to do is, is have an honest conversation about uh, what the likelihood of, of risks and benefits are before a major operation like this or a liver transplantation. What do we do uh, in terms of monitoring patients? Um, you know, labs all the time, and then alpha feta protein levels to, uh, to really measure whether there's any tumor left over or any tumor recurrence. Um, for transplantation, sometimes we use what's called uh, cell-free DNA, um, which is a new thing, and uh, maybe in liver transplantation, it's gonna take off but uh, the jury's still out. 
There's circulating tumor DNA that people are looking at. Um, again, these are more sort of uh, investigational at this point. But anyone with cancer is going to have lifelong follow-up for recurrence, lifelong follow-up for liver function, lifelong follow-up for whatever liver disease that it was um, that, that got them there. And then, uh, you know, I think that it's always uh, important to make sure that you, you follow with your, with your doctors, whether it's a hepatologist that's following you or your gastroenterologist or, or your primary care, just to make sure that, you know, your liver is being taken care of. A little bit about uh, transplantation. We talked about, you know, most, uh, most liver cancer is, is multifocal. It's multiple different places. Taking the whole liver out is really the best cancer operation because it gets rid of the, you know, the, the diseased organ with the widest margins. Transplantation is the only way to treat the cirrhosis and it gives you back your normal liver function. Um, and we do it for a lot of different things other than liver cancer, other than hepatocellular carcinoma. There's indications for neuroendocrine tumors and cholangiocarcinomas and other tumors. And there are places that even do it for colorectal meds. I'm not going to get into that right now. Uh, but, you know, I think the indications for liver transplantation are getting wider and wider. Some, you know, I'm going to finish with some new developments. Um, I've been using a lot of uh, fluorescence during, in, in my operations. It really helps identify tumors in the operation. This is basically what it looks like. The tumors get highlighted green as I'm operating on them. It helps me with margins. It helps me identify these things. Um, and so, you know, I think the technology is getting a lot, lot better. Um, and I think that, you know, we're getting better as a team in terms of the, what we can offer to our patients. Um, and, you know, there's some indication that the fluorescence actually is a good marker of, of sort of how bad the tumor is itself. So just as a summary, um, liver cancer, HCC must be really properly staged before a whole treatment plan can be done. You know, again, this is what we talked about. This is the whole team thing, best imaging, best medical assessment, best liver disease assessment. It's a, it's a team thing. And so, um, and everyone needs to be individualized. We need to really take a look at individual patients to optimize their care. There's transplant, there's no transplant. There are other options, resections, non-resections, clinical trials, palliation. And so early referral, going to a, a center that is, you know, this, that's what they do is very important. And a multidisciplinary approach is key. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Zarampar. That was great information. We'll now turn it over to Dr. Guy, who will oversee this first Q&A. You're on mute. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Zarapar um, and Dr. Eshram for this, those great talks. We have a lot of questions in the chat. So I'm just gonna get going here. So this is for you, Dr. Eshram. How does a diagnosis of liver cancer affect transplant candidacy? How to think about transplant priority and wait time for patients with liver cancer? Yeah, so some patients that have liver cancer are a liver transplant candidate. And that's based on the size and the number of the tumor and making sure that it isn't elsewhere throughout the body. Um, and so when we talk about whether or not a patient is a candidate, then we have to also make sure that they have um, no other medical problems that might um, make a liver transplant um, unsafe. And so a patient that has an evaluation for liver transplant, and if the evaluation looks good, and the tumor is um, within criteria for a liver transplant based on the size and number, then they would be placed on the liver transplant list. Uh, and then there's a bit of a wait time. There's usually treatment for the liver cancer while the, patient's being, while the patient is waiting for a liver transplant, and that might be performed by the interventional radiologist. So a taste or a tear might happen. And that's really to control the tumor while someone's waiting for a liver transplant. And then there's a waiting period um, to make sure that the tumor doesn't come back um, because really it's important to make sure if we do a liver transplant, then it's gonna be a cure. Um, and so there is a bit of a waiting time when we talk about listing for transplant. 
And then after liver transplant, um, we look at the, the tumor from the liver that's been removed, and then we can get an idea of how likely that tumor might um, recur after transplant, which is usually pretty low. And that's a great segue into one of the other questions, which was a question about the risk of liver cancer recurrence after transplant. So maybe walking us through how you think about that. Mm -hmm. So the, the rate of recurrence after transplant is based on the, the size uh, of the tumor before, before transplant. Uh, but also when we look at the explant, the, the liver that is removed, uh, the one with the liver cancer, uh, we look at it under the microscope and there are certain features on that explant that will tell us what the likelihood is. So we compare what we thought the size and the number was before transplant with what we're seeing in the explant. And there are certain scores, certain models um, that are used like the morale score and the retreat score that your doctors would know how to calculate to give you an idea of what the likelihood of recurrence is. Excellent, excellent. Um, and this is a question for Dr. Zarin Part. How often is fluorescence used? Is this a common thing across centers and are there any side effects to using it intraoperatively? So um, it's not common across centers. Uh, there are a handful of places that use it routinely. I use it all the time. Um, and the reason for that is twofold. One is it gives you extra information that you're not gonna get. Two, um, it's easy, uh, meaning that uh, I always see my patients before operating on them, you know, a few days before. It's a good chance to really kind of talk about things, answer any remaining questions. They come in on the same day as they're seeing their anesthesiologists already, so it's not like an extra trip. Um, and it, you know, it allows us to give an IV injection of the of the indocinin green to them that day. Um, it take, you know, basically I can do that, you know, anywhere between one and and up to fourteen days before. Because what happens is that. The fluorescent dye actually gets taken up by the liver, but the abnormal parts of the liver actually hold on to the dye, and that's what helps fluoresce in the operating room. Um, what are the side effects? Really, it's pretty minimal. Uh, this is a dye that's been used since, uh, you know, I don't know 60, 70 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I've actually checked my own liver function multiple times with it. And yeah. It doesn't feel like anything. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not like it makes you green or your pea green or anything like that either. Um, so the only reason not to use it is, uh, is theoretically, if you have an iodine allergy, you're more likely to have an allergic reaction to the drug. So we don't give it to patients who have an iodine allergy, um, but that's about it. You know, I, I think the nice thing with it is that um, it, you know, again, it's just additional information. There's really very little, uh, very little sort of risks to it. Okay. Um, one question that came in is advice around one, second opinions, and two, what if you're, someone on your team is not the right fit for you? Can you get someone else to replace them? So maybe start with that one, Dr. Eswaran, and then we can talk about second opinions after that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's not uncommon. Um, sometimes you don't have a connection with an individual um, and don't feel like it's the right fit. Um, so within an institution, um, there's usually multiple uh, providers within that uh, subspecialty. So one option would be to request um, a, a, another individual in that institution. Um, but certainly seeking a second opinion at another institution is perfectly reasonable. Um, and I think most all providers should be um, open to that and don't feel like that someone was going to be offended or you're going to um, be in be in the wrong in that decision. So I think most providers uh, encourage people to to seek a second opinion if you want to and um, you are certainly free to do so. I agree. I agree. Um, so another question that came through was, is there a better chance for a more favorable outcome if you opt to undergo surgery, for example, resection or transplant, uh, or do you usually see better outcomes with systemic therapies like we were talking about yesterday? So maybe Dr. Zan and Par, you want to take this one. Yeah, so um, I think when it comes to liver cancer, uh, the goal is to cut it all out, whether it's transplantation or cutting part of the liver out, you know, we kind of went over how to make that decision. Uh, most 
reason for that is that, um, you know, for transplantation, the liver disease is the problem. Um, you know, we need to get rid of the liver disease. There are cases in which systemic therapy, you know, systemic therapy uh, is good, but the response rates are actually not that great. You know, we talk about it being um, much, much better than, than, you know, what we used to have. That's true, but it's still not that great. We talk about five-year survivals after transplantation for liver cancer of 75%. With systemic therapy, it's nowhere near that. So if the option is available, meaning that if the if the tumor is within criteria for and the patient is within criteria for for any sort of surgical options, um, that gives you the best chance. Now, does that mean that you know just because you operate on someone, you can't give them systemic therapy later? No, that's not true. Um, and vice versa, if you get systemic therapy and you become within criteria, then you certainly you know, can have, a, have an operation. So I don't necessarily think of this as either or, right? And the same thing with, with transplantation or getting, um, getting some sort of local regional therapy. Just because you're getting local regional therapy doesn't mean that you're not gonna get later treatment or just because you're on a transplant pathway doesn't mean that you're not gonna have your tumor treated. So this is kind of all hands on deck all tools on the, you know, in, in the tool belt are going to be used depending on, you know, what you're eligible for. And I think that just really speaks to Dr. Eshwaran's graphic where she had the patient in the center and all the disciplines and the picture of everyone in the room. Like we're continually assessing where a patient's at and what's the right therapy for them at the right moment. Um, and yes, usually we're thinking that transplant is a cure for liver cancer. So we're really aiming for that when that's possible. Um, some more questions here are, um, at, um, what is the acceptable alpha feed protein range for listing and continued listing? And um, can we talk a little bit about how blood type affects transplant? Sure, so there is an, oh, who is it for? Yeah, that's for Go you. For it. Go for it. So uh, yeah, so the alpha feed protein is a protein marker in the blood that detects uh, that can detect liver cancer. So if it's very high, that suggests um, maybe a, a more advanced stage of liver cancer. So um, for a liver transplant, it needs to be below 500. Uh, and um, if it is high and the tumor is treated, then that number can come down. But there is, um, there is a requirement that it is lower than 500. And then, um, how about the effect of uh, blood type and transplant? So you get listed according to your blood type. Uh, if you're an O or an A blood type, then you basically have to get an O or an A donor. Um, if you're a B or an AB, you generally, if your MELD is lower, you get a B or an AB. But as your MELD climbs higher, you'll have access to just because A, B, and B are you know, less likely to get a matched blood type donor, you will get access to the, you know, if you're a B, you'll get access to the O's. And if you're an AB, you'll get access to an A, B, or an O. Um, but yes, I, I mean, I think uh, as long as the blood types are compatible, then getting the, the liver is, is acceptable. Now that said, um, in living donor situations, and this is not something that we do a lot in the United States, but in living donor situations, there are protocols for mismatched blood type donation. Um, I think that there are not many transplant centers in the US, but you know, the transplant centers in, in Korea and, and China who are uh, who, who you know don't have the deceased donor options as much as we do here, they do much more of that disease of the uh, mismatched donation. The um the complications are higher just because of the mismatch, um, but it can be done. So I think one of the take-home points is asking your physicians if you're on the transplant list, you know, what blood type am I? What is the MELD score of transplant in my lo location? And how long am I expected to wait? These are kind of questions that we're all very happy to answer on an individual basis. Um, uh, probably one of the final questions we have time for here is at what point in someone's care would you recommend them to consider a clinical trial? Is it when a patient is out of other potential options or earlier in their treatment plan? Dr. Eswaran? It's a great question. And I think some of this was covered yesterday um, in the first day of this conference. Um, and I think it was highlighted that there's no, no acceptable or unacceptable, I should say, there's no 
unacceptable time to consider a clinical trial. It can be early and um, I think your team should know how to access clinical trials. And even if you're newly diagnosed, um, it's definitely appropriate to ask at that time what clinical trials are available for my stage of cancer, knowing my other medical conditions. Uh, and then the team can help you find um, an access to those. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, clinical trials just basically means we think these two things are at least conceptually almost equivalent and we need to do a trial to make sure to see if one is better than the other. Um, and whether it's a surgical clinical trial or a medical clinical trial or any kind of clinical trial just depends on where, you know, it just depends on what the trial is, is planning on studying. Um, and so, you know, anywhere along the, uh, along the line, you could be eligible for a clinical trial. Um, and the other thing to consider is that just because it's a clinical trial doesn't necessarily mean that we have no idea what one is going to do versus the other. There, you know, any kind of clinical trial that's been vetted by, uh, any, you know, a system that has to go through an investigational review board, has to go through, you know, the bigger clinical trials have to actually, you know, be, be registered and, and gone through with the, through the FDA. So the, multiple, multiple people have looked at it and said, you know, there is equipoise, right? So that we don't really know whether one is much better than the other. And so we have to do the trial. Um, and somewhere along the line, if it's obvious that one is better than the other, the clinical trial will actually get stopped. So you're not going to, you know, no one's going to say you need to be on a trial because, you know, we want to, you know, I, I don't know, we don't know, um, but because we know one is better than the other, you could get the terrible one. Um, I think if the trial is available, um, it's certainly something to consider. But I will say, um, Dr. Guy, that you don't always need a clinical trial. Right. You know, if if you have a transplant or resection as an option and your doctor and your team think that you're going to have a, a, an excellent curative response, then you don't necessarily need to, to go beyond that. Um, it's always a good question, but um, it's not always necessary because we know a good amount about liver cancer and we have so many different options. And I think that that is a really important take home point too is, and I hope people are getting that from this conference is that there are so many options and the decisions are really complicated around what is the right option for a person at a given time. And that's why engaging your team and knowing that your team is engaging each other um, really makes a difference. So uh, if people have questions about clinical trials, yesterday's talks, including Dr. Dennis Zuckerman's talk from Stanford and Dr. Tim Grayton's talk from the National Cancer Institute are things that you can look at uh, via the YouTube page um, for the American Liver Foundation. So we are um, at time, and I just wanted to thank um, both Dr. Zarampar and Dr. Eswaran for joining us this morning and giving us a great outline as to how to be thinking about treatments and our medical teams. Um, and I will pass it over to Ivory. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gowley. That was a great session and so many fantastic questions. We will now hear from one of our sponsors. Azi Inc. Human Healthcare, or HHC, is our goal. We give our first thoughts to patients and their families and helping to increase the benefits healthcare provides. As the U.S. pharmaceutical subsidiary of Tokyo-based Azi Co. Limited, we have a passionate commitment to patient care that is the driving force behind our efforts to discover and develop innovative therapies to help address unmet medical needs. Azi is a fully integrated pharmaceutical business that operates in two global business groups, oncology and neurology. Our U.S. headquarters, commercial and clinical development organizations are located in New Jersey. Our discovery labs are in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania. And our global demand chain organization resides in Maryland and North Carolina. To learn more about Azi Inc., please visit us at us.azi.com and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm excited to now welcome Dr. Jacob. Dr. Jacob is involved in multiple aspects of the clinical practice within the section of digestive diseases at Yale New Haven Transplantation Center. Her clinical interests include evaluation and treatment of patients with hepatitis B, C, fatty liver disease, drug-induced liver disease, cirrhosis, as well as management of patients before and after liver transplantation. 
She serves as attending hepatologist and attending transplant hepatologist at Yale New Haven Hospital. Welcome. Thank you so much for um, uh, inviting me to uh, discuss a topic very close to my heart um, as a um, uh, liver doctor taking care of many patients with advanced uh, liver disease and liver cancer. Uh, I came to appreciate the very importance of uh, advanced care planning and palliative care uh, for my patients. And um, uh, I have a few slides I'm gonna share because um, uh, my goal is to point out um, some of the common misconceptions that still remain when it comes to offering advanced care planning and palliative care for uh, uh, patients in general and specifically for patients with uh, liver disease and um, uh, hopefully uh, we can do better. So, um, one of um, the first um, myth I wanted to talk about is um, uh, the very definition of advanced care planning and palliative care, uh, because uh, it still remains uh, for many people both. Uh, uh, medical providers and uh, patients, when they hear advanced care planning, palliative care, they um, immediately think about death, about end of life care, hospice care, and this is very, very wrong. Um, advanced care planning uh, ensures that the future medical care reflects patients' personal goals, values, and preference, and actually everyone should have an advanced directive regardless if they have an illness or not. In, um, uh, it, uh, the forms are uh, easily accessible, they are free uh, online, uh, they might differ across the state, uh, across the state, but most of the time will involve um, uh, desi um, designing um, a, a, a person as a, a surrogate decision maker and also making a living will, which will point out the relevant goals of care. Um, for um, uh, that particular person. When it comes to palliative care, this is a subspecialty that aims to improve the quality of life of uh, patients and uh, their caregivers who are facing any advanced chronic or life-limiting uh, illness. Uh, it, um, uh, it's not, definitely is not limited to cancer alone, although um, our patients with liver cancer in a way um, they have the advantage that our oncology colleagues are more advanced in offering uh, palliative care, uh, part of their uh, routine care. But now we are trying to catch up and uh, expand this to anybody with advanced liver disease. And truly, palliative care is a subspecialty that includes um, uh, 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 pays a lot of attention to symptoms management, uh, the provision of uh, the, the, advanced care planning and uh, trying to um, bring everybody together uh, to, uh, this, to reflect and discuss uh, on future care, and very importantly, uh, caregiver support. Uh, yes, hospice care is part of uh, palliative care, but it's offered for patients with estimated survival less than six months. So definitely, uh, palliative care is not limited to uh, hospice care alone. Uh, it's um, uh, interesting because uh, one might say what's in a name, but uh, names are very powerful, uh, words are powerful. We are involved in a palliative care study offering uh, palliative care to our patients with uh, advanced liver disease. And when we initially approach our patients for this study, many were turned off just when they heard palliative care. So we have a lot of work to do to clarify um, this concept and the importance of um, uh, using palliative care in uh, uh, our uh, management of liver disease. Why are advanced care planning and palliative care important? This is definitely not just to um, point that uh, somebody's wishes are do not resuscitate. It's much more than that. Advanced care planning uh, ultimately will lead to um, writing an advanced directive, um, which uh, it showed that uh, it helps um, not only the patients think through what they want to happen to them in the future, 
but it actually helps a lot the surrogate decision makers and the family members who, uh, instead of struggling with taking these type of decisions um, in a very stressful set, uh, setting in ICU when things are really, really bad, uh, they have a sort of a plan that was discussed in advance and everybody is on the same page. So um, it's, uh, I just wanted to point out that it is very important, not just for patients, but also for uh, their family, uh, family members. Um, as far as palliative care is concerned, many um, still think that um, this means uh, giving up and um, stopping any other care. Uh, again, as I said, uh, many still associate palliative care with uh, death and end of life. And this is, again, very, very wrong. Um, palliative care benefits are uh, shown to um, it, uh, affect people, especially earlier in their disease course, because it can actually improve quality of life, increase patient and their caregiver satisfaction, reduce symptom burden. So um, reserving palliative care only at the end of life um, really deprives uh, patients and families of um, many benefits. So when to do advanced care planning? And again, this is um, another very uh, misunderstood uh, concept because um, uh, many still think uh, this is uh, for the terminal stage. Advanced care planning is an ongoing process throughout um, uh, the illness, the course of illness trajectory. And uh, also very important, it, it's a living process. It can change as the care preferences will change as the disease is progressive. Um, unfortunately, patients with liver cancer face not only uh, the problems related to their liver cancer, but also uh, related to their uh, failing liver because cirrhosis, um, although in uh, many patients with liver cancer can, be, can remain re relatively stable in uh, some patients, by itself can get worse. So even if the cancer is small or is treated, uh, the cirrhosis can progress to what we call decompensated cirrhosis with associated problems related to organ failure and associated um, uh, decrease uh, in uh, survival. So as you can see um, on the first picture, this is kind of what happens to somebody uh, with advanced uh, age, uh, they become frail, uh, they might have ups and downs, and ultimately, uh, all of us uh, die uh, eventually. Patients with advanced cancer um, have, uh, and as long as um, it doesn't um, cause organ failure, uh, can have a sort of linear trajectory as the cancer advances, um, the patient's function uh, declines, and uh, ultimately, they die. But organ failure is very um, uh, different because uh, patients can have uh, good times followed by bad times with hospitalizations. Uh, then there is some recovery. A lot of times it's not back to uh, where they started, um, followed by again worsening and ultimately uh, death. And it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen. And um, uh, like anything uh, in life, it's better to be uh, prepared for the worst and um, uh, hope for the best. Uh, but this is a concept that uh, many uh, patients and their providers uh, still struggle with. So my point is that um, advanced care planning is never too early to start advanced care planning and um, definitely shouldn't wait until, uh, the, very, um, until the very end. Another um, very uh, common misconception is that uh, palliative care means um, you know, stopping um, life prolonging treatments or curative treatments, and it's sort of black and white. You either uh, do treatments such as transplant or surgery or everything that you heard on prior talks, or uh, all of those stuff, and uh, you start palliative care. So um, this is very wrong because uh, patients who um, are earlier in their disease stage and still benefit uh, from curative treatment, they have other uh, symptoms or um, problems affecting their quality of life that are not addressed by um, 
usual liver treatments. And if uh, we don't practice care, keeping in mind palliative care principles, those patients do not um, uh, get the full um, benefits that we, uh, we can offer. So most of the time, it's sort of um, uh, an interbalance between um, what can be done for um, the liver cancer or for cirrhosis treatment, but keeping in mind uh, palliative care uh, in controlling symptoms, supporting the patients and their families, while they uh, have to cope with these very complex decisions and treatment um, choices they have to make. Uh, as the disease progresses, um, when I get to the point that um, curative treatment are no longer um, an option, that's where indeed uh, palliative care takes a first, um, uh, a first place. And uh, at the end, uh, hospice care is uh, in place to ensure the comfort of the patients and their uh, caregivers. But as you heard before, and that's why it's important to have um, a multidisciplinary approach to treating uh, liver cancer, it's very important to offer the right treatment to the right patient because offering something super invasive um, can actually uh, cause somebody to die sooner than um, if otherwise the care would have been um, focused on symptom control and quality of care. Uh, what um, about timing of um, uh, advanced care planning and uh, palliative care and the setting of uh, advanced care planning and palliative care? These discussions, as I said, it's better to start early in the disease course and ideally to be in a more relaxed setting, uh, regular uh, clinic visits. Um, and it's important to start early because um, it's also essential to have the patient uh, stable and well enough to participate. And I cannot emphasize enough how it's also very important to involve uh, the caregivers and the surrogate decision makers because this type of discussion shouldn't happen in the vacuum. So even if the patient um, you know, is very clear between the patient and their providers, what they want to do if the surrogate decision maker is not involved in these uh, discussions, it's going to be very difficult for them to uh, make uh, this type of uh, decisions when uh, uh, the time comes and the patient can no longer um, have a say in the, what is going on. Uh, also very important because uh, as I mentioned, the course of disease uh, can fluctuate uh, over time. Uh, it's important to reevaluate this type of um, uh, decisions or wishes after sentinel events such as hospitalizations, especially if um, intensive care unit treatment was uh, needed or development of complications or um, before making a decision to uh, proceed with uh, life supporting therapies or surgeries or so forth. And um, again, very important is to know that palliative care is not limited to hospital setting alone, and it should be integrated throughout uh, all the phases of care, be it inpatient, outpatient, in the transplant clinic, before, after transplant, long-term care facilities, um, at home. Uh, palliative care should follow uh, where the patient is. Who can do advanced care planning and palliative care? Again, this is another um, misconception that for advanced uh, directive, you need a notary public or an attorney. Uh, as I said, the forms are free online. Uh, you do not need um, um, any, um, anything extra unless you wish to add to the advanced directive a witness, uh, witnesses affidavit, which um, it is recommended because if there are any discussions later on, uh, the, the witnesses, they don't have to uh, appear in front of a judge or you know, uh, get involved in legal proceedings. So this would uh, give more strength to the advanced directive. But uh, if one doesn't wishes to do so, again, it's very um, easy to fill out these forms uh, together with the medical uh, provider so the patient understands um, the various choices they can um, uh, they can have as far as uh, their goals of care, but also uh, to make sure that their uh, surrogate decision uh, maker uh, 
uh, know uh, what um, uh, what are their wishes for the future care. Last but not least, um, I also want to point out that uh, palliative care and advanced care planning uh, should be done by providers from any uh, specialty. Of course, with the help if needed from specialist palliative care providers, but the need for palliative care is so high and um, we simply do not have enough uh, workforce to uh, cover, uh, to have uh, palliative care provided by specialists alone. And uh, as you saw on prior presentations, this is a team effort and it's very important to communicate uh, and very clearly with all the members in the team, keeping the patient and caregivers uh, in, uh, in center and uh, make sure their needs and uh, their wishes uh, are heard and um, addressed. Um, and I uh, just wanted to end by uh, quoting um, uh, Winston Churchill, who said that um, we should turn our advanced worrying into advanced planning so um, I don't think he had liver cancer in mind uh, when he said that, but uh, I think it applies very well to uh, proper management of uh, liver cancer as well. Thank you, and um, looking forward to questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacob. That was great. I actually love that. Let our advanced worry become advanced planning. Uh, I think that's a key, uh, key statement. Um, we will now take a poll, um, bring up that poll, and maybe some of you could um, fill this out. Would you like to learn more about this specific topic? Um, as you know, the American Liver Foundation does many different programs throughout the year, and is this something that you would like to hear more about and go into uh, take a deeper dive? So would you like to learn more about this topic? Let us know. Okay, I think those results will be coming up shortly. Yes, wonderful, 64% yes, 36% no. Um, so thank you for completing that. I would now like to introduce Dr. Patel. Dr. Patel is a triple board certified physician. She is currently the physician advisor to a group of Sutter-based registered dietitians to create healthy eating video content for patients. She is also an investigator of an NIH-funded research grant studying healthy beverage consumption in Sutter employees. Her passion is empowering her patients and others with the knowledge and tools to make practical, sustainable, lifelong healthy eating habits, especially by incorporating more helpful plant-based foods into their day-to-day -day eating. I can't wait to hear her presentation. Welcome, Dr. Patel. Hi there, everyone. Can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Good. Can hear you Excellent. In the kitchen. <laughs> well, thank you so much to um, the organizers of this conference for inviting me to share my love and passion with all of you. Um, I'm Dr. Patel, and I'm board certified in obesity, internal, and culinary medicine. And if you've never heard of the phrase culinary medicine before, I really love to think of it as like the how-to of healthy eating. It combines the science of medicine and nutrition with practical culinary skills and really helps patients translate that, um, that science into action in their day-to-day -day lives. And I'm really excited because I got two um, culinary demos for you today on um, easy to prepare recipes to include more healthful plant foods into your day-to-day -day eating. And the reason I focus on healthful plant foods is that, you know, Nutrition for our patients with cancer, as far as like what constitutes the foundation of nutrition, really isn't different from the rest of from the rest of um, the general population. You know, we really want to focus on incorporating um, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and legumes. If you're not um, familiar with legumes, that's the kind of the family that includes lentils and beans. And that really, you know, we're talking about that as a foundation, but that doesn't mean those are the only foods that you can ever include. You know, there's different cultures, taste preferences, backgrounds, nutritional needs. And so, you know, we have to um, create a, a really personalized approach when it comes to healthy nutrition for our patients. I think the challenges that patients with um, cancer can face is that there's certain, you know, treatment related or disease related effects that can make it difficult for you to 
meet your nutritional needs. And we've heard it multiple times on this conference today, but really working with that multidisciplinary team, especially the registered dietitian, if that's available to you, to help um, troubleshoot and address some of those challenges, especially side effects of treatment. You know, if you are having nausea or if pain is limiting your ability to eat, or if there's, you know, mouth sores or other um, issues that you're having, like GI distress with like vomiting or diarrhea, I think it's really important to work with that team because, you know, those side effects are usually unique to treatment um, for patients with cancer. And we want to make sure we address those so that you can meet your nutritional needs. You know, one of the things that I like to focus on, especially for patients with cancer, is making sure they're getting enough um, what I call high quality protein into their their day to day eating. As we're all aging, we're losing lean muscle mass and our muscle mass is so important to try to um, keep as much as possible because, you, you know, as you age, you get more frail or when you have um, illness, you can become more frail. And we really want that muscle mass to help um, us stay stronger for a lot of different reasons. And I think, you know, I really view nutrition as like the foundation of healthcare. And, you know, I don't think we do a very good job in our current medical system emphasizing that, but I think that's starting to change. And I think that this will, you know, healthy nutrition helps our patients with cancer really um, just improve their, their side effect profile, their longevity, and also tolerating treatment better. And so I am um, just so excited to be here and talk to all of you. I want you to all um, know one thing that I tell my patients all the time that, you know, it's when you're trying to make healthy eating habits or you're trying to eat more um, healthy, it's really important not to get caught up on the perfection of it. My motto in life is progress, not perfection. It's the motto that I follow for my own life when I'm trying to make healthy lifestyle changes. And we really, I think as a society, there's a lot of like you know, kind of negative um, messaging around food. You know, you must cut this out or you have to cut that out. This has got to go. You can never enjoy, you know, or have the foods that you enjoy from time to time. And it's, it's I think that's just not the best message to send. And so I ask my patients to flip the script. I ask them, well, instead of focusing on what needs to go from your diet, how about we focus on like what we can add in? And one of the most common things that my patients tell me is, doc, I just don't like vegetables. I just don't like them. And so for me, because this is uh, very interesting when patients say that, I ask them, well, what do you mean? What vegetables do you like? Can we focus on adding more of those? Um, can you tell me how the vegetables were prepared? And I think that's where the culinary medicine aspect of it really comes in is, you know, not everybody likes raw veggies and not everybody can tolerate raw veggies, but, and, and not everybody likes steamed vegetables either. And so trying to find ways using different culinary techniques, creating a blueprint with my patients to help them get more veggies on their plate. So without um, further ado, I'm going to be showing you two recipes today. So um, the first one is quinoa lettuce wraps with spicy peanut sauce. And then the other one is a buckwheat noodle salad. Um, and you're going to notice that both of these recipes share kind of common ingredients. And this is why I picked them, because one of the things that I also hear from my patients is that I just don't have time, right? I don't have time. And, I, and in this busy, crazy world, especially if you're, you know, navigating um, healthcare and treatment for your cancer, time is of, you know, it's really limited, right? And so I like to pick in recipes that can cross utilize ingredients. So it's not that you're having to, you know, make two recipes from scratch, but you can at least do some of the prep work for both of the recipes and then use them in different ways to create different dishes. So that's what I did. And that's why I purposely picked these two recipes. And I'll talk a little bit um, as I'm going, but let's get started. I'm going to pull my camera down. Okay, perfect. Great. So I have quinoa here that I cooked last night, actually, I made it ahead of time. So this was one half cup of quinoa. And oh, by the way, I was just want to mention, I'm gonna kind of talk about the ingredients, but you don't have to write anything down. We're gonna send out the recipes so that if you all wanna try this at home, you can totally do that. So this is one half cup cooked quinoa, meaning that it creates a whole cup of cooked quinoa. So it's, it's um, I cooked it in a little bit of low sodium uh, broth, but you could actually you know use just water and it's fine. I put it on the stove top, very easy was cooking while I was chopping um, all of my veggies. So to this part of the, let me just switch something really quick here. To this quinoa, I'm gonna first, oops. Sorry guys, one second. Okay, to this quinoa, I'm going to add um, some diced bell peppers. So I took um, green, yellow, and or green, orange, and red bell pepper. 
I diced it up pretty finely. So we're just gonna, I'm gonna use my hands. My hands are clean, always important. So we'll put that over there. And then I'm gonna add some chopped red onion. So I did this last night. And if you guys, um, if you can't see, just let me know, okay? So you put that in there. And then I love garlic. So garlic and on red onion, I wanna just kind of say one thing about them. They contain a special kind of fiber called prebiotics. And if you've never heard of that, you've probably heard of probiotics, which I won't get into, that's a whole lecture on its own. But a prebiotic, are um, basically a type of fiber is a type, certain fibers are a type of prebiotic. But basically they can be used by these um, beneficial bacteria that are in your gut to create um, beneficial compounds essentially. And so garlic and um, onions and apples amongst other foods like asparagus have a special kind of prebiotic fiber. And I'm just kind of throwing these tidbits out there just for your knowledge only. I don't want you to get fixated on like, okay, I can only eat these foods. I think the goal always is to include a variety of different types of foods in your day-to-day -day eating so that you get, you know, all, all the different kinds of nutrients that are out there. So we're going to add just some garlic that I minced up. So what I did is I actually took the garlic, um, I put it in my chopper. I did not mince this by hand. I actually hate mincing garlic. It's like one of the most, one of my least favorite um, activities, but I like to just mince it ahead of time. I'll use it throughout the week in different dishes. So it's a nice little time-saving tip. If you don't like mincing garlic or you don't want to even deal with that, then there's actually these garlic cubes that um, you can get at different like grocery stores that are in the frozen aisle. And I like to use those sometimes, especially when I'm in a pinch and I just don't have a lot of time to make dinner. I just use those instead and that's totally fine. We're gonna add some lime juice. This is freshly squeezed lime juice. And then I'm gonna add some fresh ground pepper. This is garlic pepper. I have kind of an obsession with garlic. My husband's like, oh, the extra garlic in here today. So we're going to do that and we're going to mince this. This is going to be the base for our lettuce wrap. And then what we're going to do next is actually make the sauce, the spicy peanut sauce. So we're going to give that a good mix. So as you can see, we added some onions, garlic, bell pepper, Smells quite good. I know y'all can't really smell it, but I promise it smells good. And this recipe seems to be a hit with people that in the past have told me they don't like quinoa. Um, something special about quinoa is that first of all, it's the whole grain and both of the kind of grain bases that I'm using today are whole grains. If you've never heard of that word, that's okay. Um, a whole grain is essentially a, um, a grain of a quote unquote cereal or pseudo cereal, but essentially uh, a like a plant essentially. And they, it contains all three parts of the grain. It contains the bran, the germ, and the endosperm. All grains start off as whole grains, but what happens to certain um, grains is that they get processed where they remove um, the bran and the germ. And you're just left with like kind of like the carby um, endosperm with some vitamins. So when you process it that way, you kind of remove some of the nutrients, especially the fiber that's sitting in the bran. And so I always say that, you know, we want to try to eat as um, health promoting carbohydrate containing foods as possible and whole grains are definitely in that category because they contain all of the nutrients since the grain is still intact. And so quinoa is great. It's a gluten free whole grain. Um, it's also higher in protein compared to some of the other whole grains out there. And so I like to eat it. It's very easy to cook. You could, you, you could cook it in a rice cooker. You could cook it on the stove. You could cook it in a pressure cooker. Um, I have an instant pot you can cook a big batch and actually just freeze it for later. It freezes really well. Um, and you can also just find frozen quinoa. I've only found it at Whole Foods, so it's a little bit pricier there. So I just like to make my own and just freeze a big, big batch of it and then use it like throughout the, the week. Or if I'm in a pinch again, like I'll just, you know, maybe I'll make this. Um, so yeah, this is the quinoa. So we'll put that to the side. Now for the sauce, um, I have, a couple of tablespoons of peanut butter with honey, one tablespoon of honey in here. And so we're gonna mix that together. So my honey and my peanut butter were pretty runny to begin with. You could actually just put this in the microwave for like 15 seconds and it'll really loosen up. But the honey that I got, I'm using today is actually from Greece because my husband and I went there um, several months ago and 
brought some honey back and I haven't used it. So I said, well, let's use it today. So it was nice and um, not thick. So there's that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add one tablespoon of water. We're also gonna add one tablespoon of lime juice. And I don't have sriracha because there is a sriracha shortage, sadly. And so I'm gonna add a little bit of oops, chili. And this is just the chili garlic sauce. And then instead of soy sauce today, I'm actually going to be adding something called coconut aminos. And if you're not familiar with coconut aminos, it's a soy-free um, soy sauce alternative. And the reason I like it is because it gives a pretty similar profile to soy sauce, but it has almost like half the amount of sodium that normal soy or regular um, low sodium soy sauce has. So I have low sodium soy sauce here for comparison. So one tablespoon of this low sodium soy sauce from Trader Joe's is 530 milligrams. And then one tablespoon of this coconut aminos is um, 270 milligrams, so almost half of what that soy sauce is from Trader Joe's. And it, like I said, very similar profile. Um, it's also gluten-free in case if there's people that wanna or have to avoid gluten for any reason, soy sauce um, is not gluten-free in general, but uh, this coconut amino says, I got this at the grocery store. This has been my like go-to, especially for our patients with um, liver disease and cirrhosis, you know, if they're really having to watch their sodium intake, I always talk to them about coconut aminos. The other thing to keep in mind is that even though, um, I always tell my patients this, sometimes the 2.3 grams sodium kind of reduction or uh, limitation, I should say, or the two gram sodium limitation, that's actually not that far off from what the general population should be eating. In the US, we traditionally eat a lot more sodium than um, we should be eating. We eat about 3.4 grams. And a lot of that comes from packaged processed foods or foods that are made outside of the home. And so I, I try to make my patients feel better and tell them that, hey, look, I know it seems like a restriction, but it's actually what your doctor is eating or what I'm, or what I'm trying to eat too. So I think it, you know, hopefully puts that into a better context. Because like I said, it's about abundance and not restriction. So we're gonna add two tablespoons of this in here. And then I'm gonna add some black pepper. and mix it all together. And if your sauce is too thick, you could also add you know, a little bit more water in there. That's totally fine. And I might have to do that. So I'm just gonna, because my peanut butter is sticking. And this is where that microwaving really helps. So we'll just add this little nice whisk that I will just put it together. And, okay, that looks good decently good. So then I have butter lettuce, which is these nice little leaves and they're great for lettuce wraps. The other thing that I like to do sometimes is I'll do something similar, but I'll do it with tofu instead of quinoa. And that just gives me a little bit more protein. So it makes the, the meal more what I like to call balanced. I think that you know, there's a lot of um, kind of refined carbohydrate heavy foods in the, in our food supply. And those aren't really um, filled with fiber and protein, which makes them less filling. And so I like to think of ways to balance out my meals. And so I think tofu or another source of lean protein is a great um, alternative to quinoa when you're making these lettuce wraps. So we have our lettuce wraps. I added some of the mixture to it. And then I'm just going to drizzle the sauce on top. And this is what we got. I know y'all can't smell it or taste it. I really wish you could, um, but it, I promise you, these are very tasty, even for people that are not a fan of quinoa. I'm gonna add some more. Okay, great. This is gonna be lunch for me in a little bit. So that was recipe number one. So recipe number two includes, is a buckwheat noodle salad. So if you're not familiar with buckwheat, it is, a grain, um, a whole grain. And contrary to what is, you see in the name, it's actually, it doesn't have wheat in it. So it is another gluten-free whole grain. And buckwheat, um, when you uh, think about it in like from the Japanese culture, there's a certain type of noodle called soba noodles. And those are also um, made from buckwheat. 
I'm using something a little bit different. This is just buckwheat pasta. I like this pasta compared to um, traditional pasta because I don't know if you can see this, but for a two ounce serving, which is pretty standard uh, across the board when you're comparing different pasta types, there's five grams of dietary fiber and it does have eight grams of protein. And so I do like to use this one um, as much as possible when I'm making the salad. And then the other thing to think about is if you um, are a pasta lover, there are you know lentil and um, chickpea based pastas out there that can also add some more protein to your day-to-day -day eating. Some patients don't like them or like the texture and there's different ones. And even I'm picky about the texture. So I have a couple brands that I like, but I like these buckwheat noodles because I don't think their texture is off. And so this is a nice little um, quote unquote pasta alternative, but that's what I'm gonna use to make this salad. So um, first I'm gonna put the actual quote unquote salad together. So instead of when I was talking about cross utilizing ingredients, so instead of those diced, um, excuse me guys, um, I am getting a call and that is as you can see, we've lost Dr. Bertel for a quick second, I, but I know she will be right back. She is, uh, I think she has two devices on, so I know she hears us from the other. So we will just give her a quick moment to join us back. Um, but hopefully you guys are coming up with some questions uh, for her and Dr. Jacob in, a, in about uh, 10 minutes when we come to the Q&A uh, moderated by Dr. Caddy. But the first item looked delicious, right? Did it not look really good? <laughs> I can't wait to get the recipe to try and make that. Um, it, it looked great. And then the pasta, I'm not sure what she's going to do with the, with the pasta, but um, it looks really great. How many people love uh, pasta? There we go. Hey, y'all. I'm so sorry I got kicked off. Um, no worries. Okay, so when I, was, I was saying, um, apologies. Um, I was saying with the pasta, so with the buckwheat noodles, we're, we're going to add these um, sliced bell peppers in there. So instead of dicing them, like I said, with the you know, cross-utilizing the ingredients, I just sliced them. And then to dice them, I just put the little slices together and just quickly diced them for the other recipe. So we added those and then I'm gonna add um, some cucumber because I love cucumber. And then I'm gonna actually slice up some cilantro. So let's just put that there for a second. So I like to slice up my cilantro stems and all, I eat it all. Um, but there's actually a funny kind of um, fun fact I should say that there are actually people out there that have just a really strong aversion to cilantro. And it's something to do with their taste buds. It's like a, there's a genetic variant out there where their taste buds um, just like process cilantro in a way that just is so not appetizing and very bitter. So there are people out there, you'll probably meet some um, that will tell you like, I just don't like cilantro. It just does not taste good. And that's okay, those people exist. I, on the other hand, am thankful I do not have that variant, but that is uh, that is a good thing. So I have this bench scraper. I love this bench scraper. It's great. It's um, great to just use to clean your bench off and scrape the ingredients into, into the bowl. Um, the other thing I'm gonna add is sliced green onion. So lots of, lots of fresh um, veggies and the herb with cilantro. And we're just gonna kind of mix that together. Okay, and I like to use these tonged um, noodle or this, this, ton this tonged spoon to mix these noodles. So we're gonna do that. Okay, great. We're gonna put that to the side for a second. And now we're going to make the sauce for it. The sauce is actually a little special. Um, you know, it contains this Korean um, fermented red pepper paste called um, gochujang. And I really like it because it adds this like savory element to it. It's not spicy. Um, and it does contain sodium or salt. And so that's why we're mindful of the salt that we add in the other parts of the recipe as well. And I'm going to use coconut aminos again 
in this particular recipe to cut down on the salt intake. But I found this at Trader Joe's. There's another brand. This is actually the one that I use. This one's not open yet, but I found this just at the grocery store. It just adds a very neat flavor to the sauce. And so that's what we're going to use here. Um, to this, I'm going to add some sesame oil. I have chili sesame oil, so that's what we're going to use. And then we're gonna add some rice vinegar and that's gonna be about two teaspoons worth. So I'm gonna measure out two teaspoons worth. And then we're gonna add some sesame seeds. So sesame seeds are part of those health promoting foods that I was talking about, you know, nuts and seeds. Um, I love sesame seeds. They add just another layer of um, texture to, to foods, especially my noodle and my fried rice dishes. I always add sesame seeds. So we're going to add some sesame seeds to this as well. And we're also going to add a, a tablespoon of the coconut aminos. So we'll do that here. And I'm using that in, in place of soy sauce because it has about half the amount of sodium and then we're going to add two tablespoons of water and then we're going to add a touch of a, a just a little bit of maple syrup to kind of balance out the flavors so we're just going to do about a teaspoon or so and we're going to mix all of this together so i got my whisk here the paste is a little thick just gonna put that all together. So as you can see, kind of different sauces. The other one's peanut based, but this one is um, the go-to chain base. But we you know we use coconut aminos. Um, the kind of unique things to the sauce were the sesame seeds, sesame oil, and the rice, um, the rice vinegar. It smells really good and kind of has this beautiful red flavor or a beautiful red color, I should say. Okay, so we have that sauce mixed pretty well. And then all you have to do is we're just going to add the sauce to the bowl. And you can add more sesame seeds. I probably will because it's nice to add that crunch. And I like to use this kind of spoon again. And we're just gonna cover. You could also use tongs. I think tongs would work really great here just to really incorporate the sauce into the noodles. And as you can see, it's not about being perfect. I clearly am making a little mess here, but that's okay. You know, life is, perfection is overrated. And the goal is to get a nice, tasty, health promoting meal on your plate. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Not everything is um, as pretty as it is on Instagram when it comes to recipes. The other thing I like to do as well, um, I like tofu. I didn't, actually didn't like it growing up at all. And I think that's because I didn't know how to prepare it or how to flavor it. And I thought it was really boring, which is I, I think a, a common thing that I encounter with patients too. It's not that they really don't like vegetables or don't like all vegetables. It's just that they haven't had a chance to find them in a way that, or eat them in a way that they like for themselves. And so you know, I, I think it's important to explore and make sure that there's, um, you know, or troubleshoot and explore ways for you to incorporate these foods into your day-to-day -day eating. So I just grab my tongs because it's easier. All right, so we're just gonna plate my noodles. And you can, you know, top it with more cilantro. I have a little bit more green onion, so I'm gonna do that. And then I'm just gonna add some more sesame seeds because why not? And voila, it is ready. So like I said, very easy, kind of uh, easier, I should say, uh, recipes to put together. And I really like to teach my patients blueprints for recipes. So the sauce, the peanut sauce, for instance, you could even make it in a bigger batch and thin it out more. And you could actually make peanut noodles out of it. If you're allergic to peanuts, you could use some sort of, um, actually I was thinking about this the other, other day when I was 
thinking of recipes. And if, if you're allergic to peanuts, the other thing I was thinking about is making avocado sauce. So you could have like an avocado sauce on top of those quinoa lettuce wraps. There's also um, seed butters out there. Like um, I think I've seen sunflower seed butter and there's a number of those. There's also tahini, which is made from sesame seeds. It's a paste that you can use um, in different types of recipes. You could use it as a sauce you, for like falafel or a pita. You could use it um, in your hummus. You could also I, use it as a base for, um, I sometimes make like a tahini sauce for um, my pasta. So there's a lot of different ingredients and uh, way, or ways to incorporate those. It's just a matter of a little bit of experimentation and finding what works for you, right? Because if it doesn't work for you in the long run, and it's not sustainable for you in the long run, then there's, you know, then it's probably not something worth pursuing at least um, in the interim. So there's a lot of people out there that will tell you, especially for our patients with cancer that, you know, there's X, Y, and Z diet they tried, or they've, you know, somebody's done this and it's worked for them for whatever health outcome they're trying to achieve. But when you really dig deeper, you realize that it's only worked them in the short term. And my goal as a physician is really setting my patients up for success for the rest of their lives, right? Because if you're doing something and it's not going to be sustainable, then it's just not the right path for you. And we want to make this a part of your lifestyle. It shouldn't feel so burdensome and um, it really, there should be enjoyment out of it. So I just, you know, food brings people together. I love talking about food with my patients. I love telling them that, you know, there's these wonderful ways to make um, these healthy meals and that we shouldn't be viewing eating healthfully as a punishment. So yeah, um, I think that's all I've got. And if there's any questions, we'll get you our contact, my contact information. Um, I know what the Q&A is up next. Yes, it is. Oh my God. Um, it is that time where from your items, I am starving. That looks delicious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. But we'll now turn it over to Dr. Patty, who will oversee the Q&A with you and Dr. Jacob. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ivory. It's nice to meet you, Dr. Patel. I, nice I know Dr. You. Jacob very well, but it's wonderful to have you both today. Thank you so much for giving us such fantastic information. Um, and yes, I think we're now all very hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we have several questions that I think um, should open the discussion, um, hearkening back to uh, Dr. Jacob's palliative care talk. Um, I think, you know, the, the questions that are coming into the chat um, really are about how you take the first step. So how do you engage your provider and your family in a conversation about advanced planning? Um, would you recommend a lawyer? Um, how do you choose your executor or, for example, your, you know, power of attorney? Um, and, you know, do you have to bring a plan to your doctor? Can you make a plan with your doctor? So could you address some of those questions? Thank you. This is, um, these are great questions all uh, into one, but um, I'll try my best. So first of all, um, for um, our patients, they have to keep in mind that um, the comfort level among their providers, it's very different. So I'm very lucky to have uh, mentors like Dr. Teddy who introduced me to palliative care and we work with an excellent palliative care team at West, ha West Haven VA, but it's an ongoing uh, learning process. So um, the same way some patients don't feel like talking about worst case scenario on death, but there are um, many doctors out there who totally freak out. So, you know, um, and you, I'm sure you came across um, uh, these uh, type of doctors or other providers in the hospital when they kind of um, sort of defer to other, um, they call palliative care counsel to start the discussion. So um, there is an ongoing uh, movement to educate all of us to do better in that uh, respect, including more training for um, uh, physicians during their residency or fellowship. But uh, again, keep in mind that everybody's comfort level is different. Uh, but there is no right or wrong um, how to approach it. Uh, ideally, it should come from your doctor. But um, if you happen to be more advanced uh, into, into this, um, it's as simple as, um, hey, doc, what do you think um, the future will, will bring to me? And um, is there anything I should uh, 
you know, take care of sooner rather than later. If I want, you know, my bucket list, when should I start um, crossing off things? And um, unfortunately, none of us is a crystal ball to figure out what the future is going to bring. So that's why it's no better time than the present. Also, keep in mind that um, as much as these type of discussions ideally would happen in a clinic setting, so there is no stress of, you know, being in the hospital, doctors you've never met, um, your doctor, your provider uh, has to run a clinic um, uh, that, you know, seeing patients every 20, 30 minutes. So a bit of advance notice would be much appreciated. You know, it's not the type of um, doorknob, so it's it's the um, uh, visit is over and let's let's talk about goals of care although again like it, it's okay um, bring it up and uh, it just requires a little bit of planning in terms of who needs to be uh, at the table to discuss this um, of course the doctors that know you the best and um, are familiar with the disease course and have a better understanding of what's going to happen in the future your family your primary caregivers we don't necessarily need to be your uh, surrogate decision makers because sometimes it's very, you know, somebody is so involved and it, we are, um, uh, most of us are very optimistic by nature. I know I usually have my pin glasses on when it comes to this and um, uh, everybody's again trying to, to move things forward. So sometimes you need a more, um, you know, uh, level person, somebody who maybe is not that involved to be your person who will make the hard decisions when the time comes. So again, the surrogate decision maker doesn't have to be your primary caregiver. Basically, you choose somebody who you think would be able to speak for you when you cannot do it uh, because of uh, worsening of, uh, of the disease. Uh, now, in terms of paperwork, uh, as I said, the forms are easily available online. Uh, again, we are uh, lucky with our uh, palliative care team. We have a social worker who um, usually makes these forms available very easily. It doesn't have to be together with a notary public or an attorney. I mean, if um, so, again, this is all about um, making you feel comfortable. If you prefer to bring an attorney to the discussion, it's okay. It's your choice, but you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to do it. Uh, the uh, not notary public and the attorney just to help your witnesses once you make your choices in terms of uh, the surrogate decision maker and the living will. Um, so it takes the pressure off the witnesses that you know everything is stamped and done and they don't have to um, um, get into any legal issues if somebody contests that specifically uh, living will. Um, and um, I'm sure I digressed a lot. I hope I covered most of. No, you did. Thank you so much. Um, so Dr. Patel, you have a couple logistical questions in the chat box. The first Go is, do, do you need uh -huh. to rinse the quinoa? You, that's a great question. So I do. Um, you don't, so some people have this like bitter taste that they get from the saponins that are in quinoa. And so I think rinsing it and again, if you've not had quinoa before, you might not know if you're going to be one of those people. So I do rinse it. I give it a couple of rinses um, before I make it. But yeah, some people do find it bitter. And so rinsing it can help with that bitter taste. Yeah. Great. And then will you provide a link to your recipes? So perhaps we can yes. attach them. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, definitely. A lot of people are making your recipe today. Uh, <laughs> I had the facility to jot everything down. So totally. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then as far as food is concerned, um, are there foods that people with liver disease should avoid? Um, so that's one question. And the other question is sort of what are the most protein dense foods that we can think about adding into our diet, even in the person who may be a picky eater? Yeah. So for number one, I don't ever like to think that there's any specific foods that should be avoided. Now, of course, if you have liver disease, we want to make sure that you're not, you know, consuming alcohol, which can cause um, further damage to your liver. Um, if you're eating food in general, like well cooked food, right, you don't want something that's raw or that's potentially going to make you ill, um, especially when you're going through treatment and your immune system may not as be as strong as possible. And so, you know, eating, if you're eating out, eating at reputable restaurants, um, making sure if you're eating meat that the meats are cooked properly. If you're um, cooking meat at home, also 
not cross contaminating ingredients, you know, using separate utensils, a separate cutting board for the meat versus the vegetables and, and really um, practicing good, just general hygiene at home, hand washing. So, um, but, you know, I don't like to, like I had mentioned earlier, I don't like to say like, you can never have something that you might enjoy. Like I like cake <laughs> and I have that from time to time and I find ways to incorporate it into my day-to-day -day eating that doesn't make it seem so um, restrictive. That doesn't mean I'm eating a whole piece of cake every day. It's just, I, I find ways that are, make sense to me. And then um, the second question about protein dense foods. So, you know, there are a lot of different foods. So all, um, I should just go in out there and say all plant foods have some amount of protein in them, even like the, the red bell peppers, but that doesn't mean that I think you should go get all your protein from red bell peppers. It's not dense. And so when we think of protein kind of classically in society, we're always thinking of it kind of, you know, focused on animal um, derived foods. And so if you're, you know, practicing um, a dietary pattern that includes both, um, like plant foods and animal foods, really focusing on uh, what I call lean sources of protein. So those are like the less fattier cuts of meat. So, you know, chicken that doesn't have a bunch of fat attached to it, like leaner cuts of um, animal, animal products, if that's what you're doing. Dairy, of course, has protein in it. Um, you know, cheese and uh, dairy products, if you're, if you consume those. The thing that we want to focus on with um, animal products is, and the reason I emphasize lean is that we want to cut down on the saturated fat intake and try to increase the amount of healthy fats that you're consuming. But, you know, like I said, for patients with cancer, it's really important to get enough calories in and really important to get um, enough protein in. And so, you know, really working with that dietitian to figure out ways for you to do it in um, a health promoting way is important. That doesn't mean that you only, if you, if you don't eat meat, cause I don't eat meat. And so I really love um, helping people incorporate more plant sources of protein into their day-to-day -day eating. And so one of the things I was going to bring out, but I didn't end up doing it is um, there's um, tofu and tempeh are probably um, some of the more accessible sources of plant protein. They're complete proteins. They're both soy products. I love tofu. I use it in place of um, like lots of different, uh, I use it, I should say, in lots of different recipes. It's almost always like the protein source that I like. Um, tempeh is a fermented soy product that actually has like a nutty texture to it. And it kind of has a little bit more of a, I don't want to say meteor texture, but it has a little bit more like thicker texture to it. And some people might enjoy that if they're trying to cut back on their meat intake. I like to make tempeh, um, tempeh burgers out of it. So I'll marinate the tempeh um, and if you just hold on, I'll just bring that tempeh out for just a second so people can see it. Um, I like to marinate the tempeh. So it has like kind of these, um, the, these ridges. And so I'll marinate it. I'll throw it into the air fryer. We'll make some burgers out of it. Maybe make some skewers out of it. Um, lentils and beans are a really great source of plant protein. They're cheap, especially the dry lentils and beans. You can make them in a pressure cooker. You can batch cook them. You could use canned versions. Just look for the varieties that are lower in sodium um, or no salt added. I do see those varieties out there as well. And so if you wanna, um, you can use those. There's frozen varieties too, but again, look at the sodium and make sure there's no um, extra sauces or anything. So lentils and beans are great. Um, I like to use some of the higher protein whole grains. So quinoa is one that I really like. Millet is another one. Um, but, you know, if you're eating a variety of foods throughout the day, um, the, the average person is probably meeting their protein requirements, but they're higher when you're going through treatment um, or if you're experiencing illness. So working with um, that dietitian is important and it's okay to supplement if you need to. Like I make a smoothie and I'll put pre-protein powder in there. It's just what I do. It doesn't taste any different, but I know it's more balanced of a smoothie instead of just a fruit-based smoothie, which might not keep me as full longer. So lots of different options to choose from. It depends on your personal preferences and your cultural backgrounds on, you know, what's in, in your finances too, right? Because like, you know, food costs are rising. We have to make sure that we, um, as your healthcare providers are working with the resources that you have to make those healthy eating habits. Thank you. That was a great yeah. answer. Um, so I think you already mentioned the struggle with salt, right? So we recommend mm -hmm. our patients get uh, no more than two grams of salt in their diet. It's really hard to have a tasty, savory meal when you're watching your salt intake. So can you tell us a little bit about salt substitutes or spices that give a kick 
that sort of mimic salt, but you know, aren't, for example, high in potassium? Yeah, no, great question. So one of the things that I mentioned during the cooking demo was coconut aminos. I will say, just make sure that when you're buying the coconut aminos to, um, to look at the sodium intake because, or the sodium content, because there are some varieties out there that will say like healthier version of soy sauce, but in reality, they actually still contain a lot of sodium. Um, I like to, to, you know, I like to tell people that, you know, salt, when we use it in cooking, especially, it's not meant to be like, we don't really want to taste the salt. We want to taste the flavor. Salt's role is to bring out the flavor. And one of the things that, um, like I used to do when I was like a kind of a more novice uh, cook, I should say, I would kind of just add like the salt in big batches, like at the end. <laughs> and in, in, when you do that, you end up using more. And so what I tell patients or people to do is that when you're cooking, um, if the recipe calls for like, I don't know, a teaspoon of salt, I would just add it in stages and then taste and adjust and add in stages. Um, Cause you might not actually end up needing that whole teaspoon and just cutting back by an eighth of a quarter teaspoon in the recipe um, as you're getting used to lower salt intakes is, is probably is probably fine. Um, using lots of fresh herbs. Um, that's why I like to use the green onions. And like I said, I have an obsession with cilantro, uh, but really using those fresh herbs to bring those flavors out. And I like using lemon juice, especially when I think a dish needs more salt, or if I need to balance a dish a little bit more, instead of just adding more salt to it, I'll add lemon juice or some lime juice. I think it really um, just helps bring the flavors out. And that, that way you're like, okay, this is more of a a balanced tasting dish. And this takes time, you know, if you're not used to cooking, like it's hard, you really kind of may cling to that recipe and that's okay. That's where we're all learning from. But like I said, you know, helping people find um, the blueprint that they can use to help make their meals versus relying on the recipe is like really what the end goal is, but that takes time. I don't really, um, you know, there are salt substitutes out there. Of course, uh, if, you know, there's the potassium salt substitute, there's potassium containing salt substitutes and you have pretty, you know, advanced kidney disease, or you have, if you're on medications like spironolactone, like you really want to make sure that you're talking to your healthcare providers and your dietitian about whether you're including some of those salt substitutes so that your, you know, potassium level can be monitored. I don't typically um, turn to those. I talk about to my patients about adding flavor, balancing out the flavor with lemon juice, um, really adding salt in that stepwise fashion so that you don't end up um, needing to add more at the very end. I think that's really important, especially like, okay, if you have a recipe and you're like sauteing onions, you know, I really do add a little bit of salt there to get the, the onions more translucent, bring out the juices. Then if I add tomatoes, I'll add a little bit there. Again, just to let it all cook down um, and just add it in small stages and measure out your salt. I will say that oils and salts, just measure them out. Um, especially if for some reason you need to watch those for, you know, for our patients, especially with the salt intake, don't, don't, um, what should I say? Try not to just take the handful and put it into the, into whatever you're cooking. So yeah, that's kind of how I view the salt. Yeah, that's very helpful. Um, I think we have about a minute left and I, I just wanted to ask Dr. Jacob, what happens if you don't want to tell your family that you have liver disease or liver cancer and you want to engage in these conversations, how would you counsel that type of, of person who's reluctant to involve their family? That, that's a very difficult situation because um, um, we've all seen how much help having family around and support, um, especially when facing such a severe illness and complex treatment decisions of so having somebody at least as a sounding board, it's, it's really important, it's just somebody to vent to. But uh, ultimately our duty as providers is to uh, follow our patient's wishes as much as we may not agree with them. Uh, so um, it, ultimately we have to respect that wish, but I usually don't give up and I keep trying to bug in the patients, you know, uh, yeah. friends are good. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think that's the most important thing you know, to have somebody who can be another set of eyes and ears in the doctor's office really helps. So even if it's not family, it could be a friend. So I agree. Um, well, I want to thank you both. I think you've given us a tremendous wealth of knowledge. I'm going to turn it back over to Ivory. Take care. Thank you so much, Dr. Patty, Dr. Jacob, and Dr. Patel. Um, that was such a great presentation from both of you in the Q&A. Um, we will now 
go to um, some patient and caregiver voices. This is our session um, to hear from them um, on their story. And if you guys have any comments or, or questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, we will first have Donna up next, and then uh, we will have Maria um, go. So welcome, Donna. You're on mute. It's okay. <laughs> Always do that. Anyway, so thank you for letting me speak. Um, so I, I actually work with Ivory. I'm here at the American Liver Foundation as an employee. Uh, I've actually been a caregiver now uh, five times in my life. Um, three as a primary caregiver and two as uh, sort of auxiliary caregivers. Um, so I, I guess what I just want to do is <laughs> tell you where I've done well and where I may have screwed up and give you some hints so you don't make the same pitfalls. Um, just briefly, my most recent caregiving experience um, was with a dear friend of mine of 20 years who found out that he had extrahepatic bile duct cancer, which means he had a mass in his a common bile duct, but it had metastasized into his lymph nodes and his chest area. Um, so he unfortunately did not have a very good prognosis. Um, and, and so can you guys still hear me? Because the screen looked like it froze. Okay. So he, he unfortunately did not have a good prognosis, but I just want to say that liver cancer treatment is advancing. So just because he was diagnosed late and had a poor prognosis does not mean that um, that would be the same for everybody. Um, for caregiving, what I have found is that there's different components to it, and some of them are very concrete components, meaning that, that it's the stuff that just sort of has to get done, medication has to be given, appointments have to be kept, care coordination has to happen. But then the more complicated part of it is almost the psychosocial and the interpersonal part of caregiving. That's, I think, where people get more burned out than, than the actual care of the patient. So what I found is that it's really important to understand your own temperament and also to understand the temperament of the person who is ill. Um, some people, when they're ill, want to kind of just live their life as normally as possible and they want to stay independent. And then other people really want you to take the lead and guide them. So if you're a caregiver who wants to jump in and do everything and you're, the person in your life who's ill doesn't want that, there's going to be a clash right off the bat. So it's just that sort of respecting each other and what each brings to the table. Um, it's normal, I think, for patients and caregivers to get irritable with each other because you've got an abnormal situation thrown in. You know, your life is one way one day and the next everything shifts because cancer is a pretty nasty visitor when it shows up and it, it affects people. Forgive yourselves and forgive each other for those bouts. I mean, Ernie, my friend Ernie, um, you know, we were good friends, but there were days that you could just tell we needed to get the heck away from each other because it's normal. You know, you're, you're clashing sometimes. Um, caregiving is 24-7, but that doesn't mean that one person should be doing everything 24-7. I'm a very type A personality, and I, when, when somebody becomes ill, I kind of go into a clinical mode, and plus now here that I work with the Liver Foundation, I knew a little about this. So my inclination was, I got to do it all. I'm going to be the one. And the thing is, then you crash and burn because you're just so on all the time. So, you know, just understand that you're not weak if you need or want help. And, and if you're the patient listening, please understand that if your caregiver needs a break or needs help, it's not because we're angry at you or we resent you or any of that stuff. It's just that we, we have to sort of take care of ourselves so that we can take better care of you guys, if that makes any sense. Um, caregiving to me is not a burden. And I think that's what people often fear. I know, you know, my parents felt, you know, they were burdening me. Ernie said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm making you do all this work. It's not a burden. Added responsibility doesn't mean burden. It means there's more to do, but it doesn't mean that you're wishing that you weren't doing it. I, I, I really feel that caregiving was a gift for, to myself as well as to my loved one. I, I would do it a hundred times over. I have no regrets about being a caregiver. Um, I want you to try to remember to utilize your healthcare team. And so I think of, I kind of think of disease or, or the, the person with the disease is the person who's in the center of it. 
So you kind of think you've got this little nucleus and then there's offshoots of, of the care team. And we, we often think, well, the care team means the doctors, the nurses, et cetera. That includes the oncology social worker. Um, that can include spiritual advisement if you're religious. That can include a, a therapist if you if you prefer a non-religious um, support. It can be neighbors. It can be friends. It can be family. It can be your pet. Pets bring incredible joy to somebody if they're animal lovers. You know, don't say, "Oh, leave the dog out of the room because it's got." Maybe your maybe your loved one wants to spend time with the dog. Maybe maybe you won't mind the tail wagging and hitting him in the leg or whatever it's going to do. Let let life go on to some extent, but recognize you have a network, hopefully that that you can can call on. And if you don't, talk to your the, the cancer team or your town social services and see what's available to come in and give you a hand. You may not need tons of help, but just having somebody come in three hours a week to help with laundry and making meals. Uh, I know Ernie had a neighbor who he just, he wanted to do something. And he said, well, can I send food over? And of course my friend, no, 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 you don't have to spend the money. It's okay. And then I thought this guy really wants to help. So I said, okay, thank you. And he sent over food and it, it, just anything like that, that can lighten the load and, and enhance things for you. Um, and, and if you are lucky enough to have a group of people who can come in and help, um, you know, just, it, like in Ernie's case, he his siblings and in-laws were able to be there. So we had we had people. And again, I'm a I'm a, a control freak. So my inclination was I'm going to assign everybody jobs. And then I realized that you don't have to do that because a lot of times what happens is people will sort of organically gravitate to what they're good at. You don't want me making food for you. I'm not a good. I'm not like the doctor who just spoke who was whipping up this wonderful meal. You don't want me in a kitchen. I'm not good at that. I'm good at the nuts and bolts. I'm good at giving medications and managing the care and doing this. Cooking is not my thing. One of the one of the sisters-in-law did laundry. The, the brother and brother-in-law worked on bills and some of the financial stuff. Somebody else ran errands to the grocery store. It all gets done because everybody sort of did their thing and helped. So if you have a network of people like that, it's okay to sit down and say, you know, how, how do you guys want to work this? Can we figure something out to make sure that... that our needs are being met as well as our loved ones' needs are being met. Um, one thing that was a, a big lesson to me, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to time myself so I don't go. Um, Ernie's hospice nurse used a phrase that has stuck with me, and she said he has to steer his own ship. So, you know, here was somebody who was diagnosed with a very serious illness. He did not have a good prognosis. His body was not doing great, but he was still him. He still had his temperament. He still had his personality. He still want, he, he was independent. He wanted to do for himself as much as possible. So I had to sort of step back and say, okay, Ernie, what do you want? You know, I didn't just assume anything because that could be a mistake. And one thing I remember that just sort of sticks out and it's kind of a dumb example, but I'll share it with you. Um, he, was, he was getting weaker and he was on medication. So, you know, his faculties were not quite you know, what they were. And you know, it was time to get ready for bed. And I said, okay, well, you know, I guess let's brush your teeth. And I grabbed the toothbrush. I didn't think about it. I grabbed his toothbrush and I started to head toward him to brush his teeth. And he said, no, I want to do it. And I went, okay. You know, and I knew he was kind of weak. I said, okay. And he just looked at me and he said, I just want to do what I was, what I always was able to do. So I handed him the toothbrush, knowing full well that he probably wasn't going to be able to brush his teeth. But I handed him that toothbrush and within about three to four seconds, it was just sort of dangling in his mouth with him kind of hanging on to it. And I thought to myself, the independence was more important than brushing the teeth. That's really what it came down to. So I just gently took the toothbrush from him. And I figured if he said, why are you taking my toothbrush? I would say, well, you finished. You did a good job. Time to go to sleep. And it would have just gone right by that he had his independence. And that was important. He steered the ship. And I kept letting him steer the ship until he couldn't anymore for safety reasons. Um, I think it's very important to integrate normalcy into a very abnormal situation. Um, cancer is not normal. You know, you're living your life and then bang, here it is. And it's like, okay, what do we do? So, you know, try to maintain balance in an abnormal situation. Again, you know, don't forget that your loved one still is the person they always were. It's just that they're now a loved one who has an, an illness. But also, Maintain or add normalcy to your own self-care because self-care is necessary and it is a no-guilt zone. 
I, I can't tell you how many times I felt guilty just leaving the house for short periods of time. But then I thought, no, I, I have to. And I was lucky I had people there. So it may sound stupid, but you know, every day when you get up, take a shower, use your normal body lotion, use cologne, do, do whatever you normally do to keep a touchstone to, the, to what you're used to. Don't forget to eat. I don't mean grabbing Triscuits and a piece of cheese. I mean, try to eat healthy food. Your body needs nourishment. You are, you are going to collapse into a heap if you don't nourish your body. Um, you know, if you, again, if you need to get out, just get out of the house, even if it's just to sit on the front steps, get fresh air, play with your dog, do something that gives you a break and gives you a sense of normal so that you can deal with the abnormal. Um, and last thoughts here, I am a little over, but it is okay to acknowledge the emotional pain that cancer provides a relationship and still know that there's that love that you feel for your caregiver there. If you have fear and anxiety and you, and you don't express these things, it's gonna fester in you and it's gonna result in depression and paralysis. In, in some way. And these feelings are going to come out no matter whether you want them to or not. They just may come out at very inopportune times and manifest as anger instead of concern. And, and again, just be patient with each other. Patients, please be patient with your caregivers and caregivers be patient with your patients and everybody be patient with each other because um, you know together it, you, can, you can make it work and it can be, it can be done and it can be done well but just make sure everybody's taken care of. So that's where I'll stop. Thank you so much, Donna. Um, that was really great. You hit on a lot of the um, points that we share with our caregivers um, through our document caregiver tips that we actually sent out to our registered attendees over the, uh, over the week for the conference. So thank you for that. We are now gonna have Maria um, come on and share her story. Maria. Hi, everyone. I am uh, sorry I'm a little bit forced today. I think I'm battling a little bit of COVID. So um, hopefully I've got enough energy to get through this. I wanted to share my experience today as a patient who has been battling HCC for four and a half years. I will go through a little bit of my treatment history and then kind of uh, go over things that I've learned just to let you guys know um, whether you are a loved one. I don't like the term caregiver or a patient um, on how I've learned to best live. And that's what we're all trying to do here. Whether you are a patient or a loved one, friend or family, you are wanting to have more days on this earth. And why are we fighting for more days on this earth if they're not gonna be good ones filled with positivity and light and life? So let me share um, just some slides because I've had so many treatments over the past few years, it's almost hard for me to remember everything that I've had done. Let me see. Um, can you guys, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. All right. So here's just my treatment history, everything that I've gone through in the past four and a half years. So I was diagnosed in April of 2018. I'm somebody who was very fit, healthy, physically strong. At the age of 43, I um, ended up with this diagnosis of HCC. I'm somebody who never had underlying liver disease, no hepatitis, no cirrhosis, no fatty liver. And so how did that come about? Um, the first thing I was asked when I went into the hospital at Northwestern in Chicago was, "Are you, know, you seem to be a younger woman of childbearing age. Do you have a history of um, hormonal birth control usage? We know that's a risk factor. It's in the fine print on birth control. That can happen. Um, we've seen oral contraceptives referred to briefly here in one of the presentations before. Um, anyway, I was misdiagnosed several times before my correct diagnosis happened. Um, first of all, I went to see someone who gave me an ultrasound. I started noticing a lump in the upper right quadrant. He actually misdiagnosed it as being a 15 centimeter hematoma. And come to find out that wasn't it. Massaging it didn't help anything. It actually continued to grow over the next month or so. A couple of trips to urgent care misdiagnosed it, but did lead me to the ER when they said, hey, this might be appendicitis. We know it was ruled out before. Go to the ER. Um, long story short, they did imaging there. They did a CT, found a very large mass, ended up quickly getting a liver resection. 
Um, my husband will come on and talk next after me, but this is in one of the strangest strokes of coincidence ever. I had been dating a man for about five months who happened to be on the liver transplant team at Northwestern and his team performed my liver resection. Really, really strange. You know, at the time he met me, I was seemingly healthy and um, had no health problems to speak of other than a little bit of hypothyroidism and that was it. Um, so after the livery section, I was believed to be in full remission. I entered a clinical trial at Emory in Atlanta, and that was just to assess um, the effectiveness of nivolumab on preventing the risk of recurrence. Unfortunately, my cancer did recur around September 2018. I've been dealing with that ever since. So first treatment I had was the Y90 radio embolization, followed quickly by a few months of nivolumab, the immunotherapy. Um, saw progression on that. I quickly proceeded to cabozantinib, followed by limvatinib, and followed by ramucirumab. So those three treatments didn't really have the intended effect on me. Um, the thing that I have been on since January 2020 that has had what they call a spectacular response in me is the atezolab, atezolizumab, bevacizumab. So I've been on the tocentric and avastin or the tocentric and invasi biosimilar ever since um, January, 2020. Um, since then, I think shortly after I started those, February, 2020, I had 10 rounds of external beam radiation. Um, this past, I think February, March of 2022, couple more rounds of radio embolization, the Y90, and I'll be doing 15 rounds of proton therapy coming up here. And just wanna switch it back to myself just to kind of talk to everybody. Um, let me go back to, sorry, Zoom is not wanting to cooperate here. So you might go on continuing to see my slides. Um, what I'm trying to do here is just basically um, talk to everybody and say that, you know, you can live a full life. It's not, it's not easily done. It does take some effort. Um, this sometimes seems trite that, you know, you just have to put in the positive mindset. You can live a full life. You know, I have been certainly in some of the darkest times. There are times where, you know, my hair all fell out at the beginning of immunotherapy. That's a rather rare side effect from immunotherapy, probably related to my thyroid. I have shaved my head off. I have given away my clothes, not to make it sound super dark here, but, you know, I'm not somebody who's going to come on here and tell you, oh, it's all sunshine and rainbows. I have certainly had to deal with a lot. There are times where I've had to really dig deep and be very resilient. And that didn't come necessarily from within myself. That um, came from having a good support team around me and just some lessons learned that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, let me pull up some more slides here and I'll show you a little bit, a few things I've taken notes on. Sorry. Okay, so one thing I found super valuable is keeping a symptom diary. I didn't really even think of this when I got diagnosed, but in, in trying to figure out what was going on with me before I got diagnosed, I just had a little notes app on my phone and I would just put down the date and what was going on that felt unusual with my body. And I never intended it to be a four plus year list of things that I would keep track of, but it's proved invaluable in later discussions with my care team on, you know, this happened on this day, this symptom or this side effect popped up when I started this therapy. And it's really filled in a lot of the gaps and it's proved invaluable in talking to my care team, deciding what might've been related to what therapy, um, things that I needed to address in my treatment. So I would urge anybody to do that, whether you keep a handwritten diary or something in your tablet or phone that you can refer to. Mine has gotten so long over the past four and a half years, I'm actually glad that I can search it by keyword because I, I would have so many notes. Um, taking good care of your body, and um, we just had a, a cooking segment, that's eating well, that's exercising to the best of your abilities, and don't be afraid to rest when you need to. There's a lot of guilt associated with taking time out for yourself and feeling like some days you just can't do some things. I mean, I've heard a lot of positivity, positivity around immunotherapy. 
And that's great. You know, there's some times where I'm able to go on long hikes, but there are other days where I feel like I can't take the trash out. And that's fine. You do have to listen to your body. You do have to make sure you push yourself that you're not living your entire life on the sofa if you do have that energy to get up and do something. But don't feel guilty about taking the rest that you need because when you're in treatment, your body is trying to repair itself. It's trying to heal itself. You have tumors or lesions in your body and that treatment is trying to work. So, you know, feed your body well, exercise to the best of your ability, stay active as much as you can, as much as your, your energy allows, and just take good care of your body. Um, the third item there is ask questions until you, are under, until you understand or are satisfied with the answers. Sometimes the answers you get from your care team are not going to be what you want to hear. The reason I put this down is I started a Facebook support group for liver cancer patients a couple of years ago, and a lot of people do come on and ask questions that probably are best posed to their care team, and it's kind of clear that they're either reluctant to ask the questions of their care team or they feel like they didn't get enough time with the care team, but you really do need to keep probing, whether it's in your in-person visit or on the portal, you need to just keep asking questions because not only can they ask, they can answer questions about what's going on with you, um, but a lot of people leave these meetings with their doctors and don't really have that warm and fuzzy feeling about, okay, here's the next thing we're going to try because they don't really understand that's the best thing for them. That leads me to the next point that, you hear this all the time, advocate for yourself. Um, don't be afraid to be a little bit pushy in your care team meetings. A lot of people are afraid of being rude or being too pushy or being a pest. You know, I'd rather be an alive pest than a dead person with good manners. If I have to just keep asking questions, whether it's in the in-person meeting with a doctor or over the portal, just to make, make sure all my questions are answered, and to make sure that whatever treatment I'm being pushed toward is the best thing for my overall health, um, are the side effects going to be something I can live with in the future if there is another option? If they're pushing me toward a clinical trial, is that just because they want somebody in the trial or is it really because it's my best option? Just make sure you're comfortable with whatever treatment decisions you're being guided toward. Um, the next one is kind of a, a contentious matter. I say leave no stone unturned from a patient's perspective. Don't necessarily rely on your primary care team to present you with all of the treatment options. I was being treated in Chicago and I'd come to basically the end of my fourth line therapy. Um, some HCC patients, I would say many HCC patients aren't lucky enough to get four rounds or four different types of therapy. Um, none of those were working for me. And at that point, there were no real answers for me there in Chicago. And I said, you know, hey, I used to live in Houston. MD Anderson is pretty much top dog around here. I said, I'm going to go ahead and book an appointment. And I was actually met with a little bit of resistance. I was met with a little bit of resistance in the form of, well, you can go down there. They're not going to have any more targeted therapy for you. I'm like, fine, I'm going to go down there anyway. And that's just be, me being a contrarian. And they did. And that's what I'm on. And I'm still on it two and a half years later. And it saved my life. And it turned me around from somebody who was very underweight, who didn't have the energy to walk around the block and walk the dog to somebody, you know, in my best periods, you know, I was on a miniature honeymoon a week and a half ago, walking nine miles a day. And so there is... I, I won't say there is always help out there. I think that's a little bit trite, but there are sometimes things out there that you are not readily being presented with, and you do need to dig. You need to put forth the effort as a patient. Get on the internet, um, look things up, research, see what you can do. Um, even if it seems out of reach to travel to another state, there are resources out there in the form of flights, in the form of discounted hotels, just you know, find all the resources that you can. Google everything because there's probably some help out there. Um, this is another thing that's important. Don't be afraid to engage palliative care. So Dr. Jacob was on earlier and talked about palliative care. And I feel that there's a misunderstanding. A lot of patients hear that word palliative and they think end of life. That's not it. 
Um, MD Anderson actually calls it supportive care, and that makes it a little bit less scary. But palliative just basically means they are addressing whatever symptoms or side effects you're having. If you're having discomfort or difficulties, whether it's lack of appetite, lack of energy, side effects from your treatment, they can step in and help you with that. So if you need to bring them in, when you are with your oncologist, you can say, hey, on my next visit, can we have palliative care join? Or can we make a standalone appointment with palliative care? That way you can say, you know, here's my list of things I really need help with. I'm not eating enough, I'm losing weight. They can help you either with drug therapy or other strategies to address things that you need to keep your body as strong as possible to go through the rigors of treatment. And that's important. I mean, that's basically what I've been doing all along is trying to keep my body just going from treatment to treatment. Um, this isn't what I would call one of the easier cancers out there. It's weird to um, think of cancers in terms of easy or difficult. None of them are easy, but there are some of them that have the good fortune of saying, okay, I'm going to go in for X number of radiation treatments or X number of chemo treatments and boom, I'm in remission. We know this is usually not that outside of, you know, certain surgical procedures. It's often a long haul with systemic therapy, local regional therapies, or a combination of both of those. Um, so you're going to need support from many sources. And that's my next bullet point, whether it's your care team, um, forging a good relationship with the nurses, your physicians, um, friends and loved ones. I don't typically use the word caregiver because, you know, I'm caring for myself. My husband does what normal husbands do, and I'm not in the position where I need somebody to give me care other than, you know, every now and then, you know, bring me something to drink. <laughs> um, outside therapists are often covered by your insurance plan, and that's something that a lot of people don't know about. I'm somebody who believes that everybody in the world could use a therapist. There doesn't have to be anything wrong with you or anything really on your mind to benefit from supportive therapy, just having an objective third party to help you deal with normal human emotions and what you're dealing with during a cancer diagnosis, whether you're the family member or loved one or friend or the patient themselves, those are not normal emotions. I mean, it's something you've probably never dealt with as closely in your life. And support groups, whether they are in person or in the um, right now in the time of COVID, a lot of them are online, such as, you know, my Facebook support group, just being able to talk to other like-minded people that are going through the same thing that you are and working to maintain your peace of mind. Sometimes that involves some tough decisions of basically shutting out avenues that are negative in your life, whether it is, I'm not talking about cutting off family members or anything like that, but if there are people around you that you know are gonna put you in a better frame of mind or activities that put you in a better frame of mind, actively seek those out. You know, Do what you can because you need not just physical strength to get through this, you need mental strength and I'm not sitting here, you know, preaching down to anyone like I'm some sort of beacon of strength because there are times when, you know, I felt like I was hanging on to the bottom rung and barely making it through, but that's what you've got to do. And, you know, I'll, I'll just wrap up and say, focus on the positive and don't forget to live. There was a, a nurse that I met a couple of weeks ago, right before I went on my honeymoon and I had the opportunity to spend about 10 minutes in the room with him while we were waiting on something. And this is a guy named Ronald at MD Anderson. And he says, you know, I've been doing this for a really long time. There are patients that I have seen that have been super clinically sick. You know, they've not been doing well on paper. And yet there's the ones that make it. And then there are some that I have seen that they you're doing pretty well compared to others. They don't make it. And why is that? And he says, you know, sometimes you can chalk it up to how effective their treatment was and all that. But he says, there's one common theme, common theme that I have seen is the ones that tend to do well are the ones that remember to live. They are not focused on death, dying, end of life. There are some patients that are so focused on dying or end of life that they just forget to live. And that is something that you cannot do because, you know, what, again, what are we doing here? We're focusing on trying to buy more days, buy more time, 
what are we trying to do here? We are trying to find more days out of life. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to just treat every single treatment, whether it is something that is hard to tolerate or whether it's something easy to tolerate, stretch it out as long as you can. The next best treatment may be just around the corner. And so I will switch chairs with my husband, Josh, here. Welcome, Josh. Hello there. All right. So I'm Maria's husband, Josh. Again, I'm uh, at uh, Northwestern Memorial Hospital. I was a liver transplant anesthesiologist. So when everything kind of happened, um, you know, I basically worked with knew everyone who was sort of involved in, you know, in her care. And so I'm going to talk today to about, you know, perspectives about what can one do as a, you know, as a loved one to sort of help things with, um, with, a, with someone who has hepatocellular uh, who has liver disease and help them sort of through everything from my perspective, both as a husband, as sort of a physician. So probably the number one thing, you know, as Maria very eloquently talked about is as a patient, be sort of involved in your care. It's difficult. You go into, you see a whole bunch of different care team members, uh, nurses, doctors, uh, physician's assistants, everything sort of like that. You get tons and tons of information and it all kind of hits you at once. And so one of the things as a caregiver, or as a loved one, support giver is probably a better term, is that you can kind of help out. You can sort of listen. If you have two people hearing this things, then when you sort of come to conclusion, it can be really, really sort of you know helpful. Because again, it's a little bit hard. You have a, a long meeting with someone and then you sort of say, what exactly did they you know sort of talk about? So, you know, I, it was difficult during COVID, uh, not able to physically sort of be in the room. Um, when she was at MD Anderson, I was in Chicago, I was able to kind of come in and Zoom. And so, you know, again, for the family members, be as involved as you can. It's not a pleasant, uh, obviously, situation to sort of be in, but you sort of have to be there anyway. Learn as much as sort of you can. In you know the treatment of cancer, there's a lot of moving pieces. Okay, uh, liver cancer. There's an oncologist. A lot of times, a hepatologist. Uh, in Maria's case, she's going to be receiving proton therapy, so a radiation oncologist, uh, interventional radiologist with sort of Y90, and so. Everybody sort of is working together to sort of offer the uh, care. A lot of times everything is led by the oncologist, but not every, it's not easy for all of the, um, for all of the um, medical professionals to know every single thing that's going on. And so therefore the best person to do that is the patient and is the patient's family. And a lot of times if something doesn't get done or you're not really sure about something were these labs done, what were the result of this? The best person to sort of bring that is the patient. And with my chart and all of that sort of information being available, that's really, um, and so again, don't be afraid to sort of, you know, ask questions, has this been done or something like that? And that's just not necessarily the patient with regard to the, to the caregiver. Um, second thing, um, now that you end up having the targeted therapy, you know, the amount of advancement in cancer therapeutics has radically changed over the last you know, 10 years. You didn't really have immunotherapy 10, 15 years ago. You didn't have targeted therapy. Uh, you just had the, you know, the awful chemotherapy agents, radiation that had horrible side effects, such as hair loss, bad nausea and vomiting, all of that sort of stuff. One of the things that has been remarked to me a lot of times is that like, wow, you know, Maria doesn't look like she, you never would know that she has cancer. She looks so good and everything like that. One, that's great for people who are, you know, who are that way that you don't have to do with that sort of stuff. However, people, you know, when you're on targeted therapy, even though you may look 
normal. A lot of times it's all you can do to just make it through the day. A lot of times Maria will talk about how she feels like she's on 5% battery. And so as a family member, as a support, you have to take that into consideration. And you have to know that, you know, there's going to be, you know, good days and bad days. There's going to be days where people are going to have all kinds of energy and they're going to feel normal. But you're going to always have to remember that there's sometimes where you just have to take things easy, uh, relax everything. The last thing that I'm going to kind of, um, last thing that I'm going to sort of uh, finishing up talking about is, Again, it's very important, I think, for a family member to be involved in the care and everything with regard to the, um, you know, cancer and everything like that. However, that can't become your entire life. And so, you know, again, you know, be involved, talk about it when you need to. But that can't, again, be an entire focus. A good way that I, we sometimes try to balance things is you say, okay, we're going to say, we're going to talk about cancer stuff for 20 or 30 minutes, get all that sort of stuff out of the way. And then once you sort of get that part, then it's like, okay, you know, we've gotten that part out. Now we're going to focus on other aspects of our life, whether or not it be, you know, um, travel, um, you know, going out, exercise, everything like that. With regard to the other stuff in your life, you know, every, we're all getting older. You're not the same person that you were five, 10 years ago. And the reality is when you have hepatocellular carcinoma, you're not going to be the same person that you were five before the diagnosis. And that's just how it is. That's okay. And so you may have to change your life a little bit. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So instead of maybe being the big crazy travel people or the big crazy workout people, maybe you need to sort of say, hey, we need to, you know, dial our life back a little bit instead of we'll focus on, you know, instead of doing these crazy long hikes, we're going to just sit in a garden and just enjoy the you know beautiful weather or enjoy sitting on the couch watching movies with our dog. You know, it's not it's not the same as it was before, but it's just as good. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and cut off there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Josh and Maria. All right, perfect. Thank you guys so much. And Donna, that was great information. And I hope that all of our attendees found that information helpful. Um, I, I think hearing from both was uh, informative and enlightening. Um, and I did see in the Q&A and, and hearing from Maria um, and hearing Kathy say um, the term caregiver. So maybe the term care partner or, um, or loved one. Uh, I kind of like that a care partner is a, is a great one. Um, and hearing Donna mention, um, and Maria kind of discussed it too, hearing about tips, monitor your own health, accept help, make time for yourself, um, find a cancer team that you trust um, and go easy on yourself. Um, you know, you don't need to beat, your, beat yourself up about anything or feel guilty. Um, you know, being a number one advocate for yourself as you go to your care team and talk with them. Uh, keep a diary and a journal. Um, and ask questions. You know, you are your number one advocate. That is something that the American Liberal Foundation puts out there all the time. You are your number one advocate. Um, so continue to do that um, and take care of yourself. As Maria and Donna both mentioned, exercise, eat healthy, take breaks, you know, for your mental and physical health, you know, get outside and get fresh air. Um, we, we saw the earlier this morning when we had um, we had the lady giving us breathing and stretching exercise from Tracy, which was fantastic. So, so many good um, points from Maria and Donna, as well as Josh. It was great to hear from him um, on different aspects as well. I don't see any Q and A in the any questions in the Q and A. Um, so, I just like to thank Donna and Maria for sharing their story with us today. It was fantastic to hear from them. Um, we will put some of the points and the tips that they both talked about in our Facebook uh, support group that we have for the American Liver Foundation for our liver cancer group. Uh, we'll put some of those tips because I think they were very helpful and useful and beneficial. So thank you so much, Maria, Donna, and Josh. We will now, I know we're at the end at two o'clock, so we will now pull up our final poll 
uh, for today. Did you find today's presentation helpful? You know, let us know. We, we would love to, to know that. Um, it allow us to help prepare for our next liver cancer conference and what we can do to improve on the conference. So as we wait for those results, Excellent, 100%, we love to hear that. <laughs> I'm glad today was helpful for all of you. Um, and as we close out, we just like to provide a little information for all of you. Check out our new website layout at liverfoundation.org for additional resources, including our upcoming events and programs. Additionally, our national helpline is open daily from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern and you can always call our helpline at 1-800-GO-LIVER. Upcoming programs that you might find helpful, a little bit of something we talked about over the two days, acute and chronic liver failure, living, with, living well with liver disease, caregivers and mental health, something we talked a little bit about today, and why a clinical trial might be right for you, something we talked about yesterday and a tad bit today. Our Think Liver, Think Life campaign is our new national five-year public health campaign, which aims to ensure every American understands their risk for liver disease, receives the appropriate diagnostic testing and care coordination, and feels well-informed and supported throughout their liver journey. Focusing first on fatty liver disease and liver cancer, the campaign launches in 10 states with liver health awareness and education events. So go to our website or thinkliverthinklife.org, special site for this campaign, to see if we will be in your state this year and sign up for the upcoming programs. And again, what a great conference I believe that we've had. I'd like to thank you to all of our speakers and doctors for spending this time educating us about liver cancer and providing such valuable and informative information. I know I learned so much and I hope our audience has as well. Special thank you to our planning committee for doing a phenomenal job in curating the last two days for their commitment and dedication to this conference and liver patients. And thank you again to our sponsors for supporting this event. We could not do it without you. And thank you to our program logistics manager, Erica, for all of her hard work and coordination over this conference. And finally, a big thank you to all of you, our attendees, for joining us on the during our third annual liver cancer conference and educated patient. We hope we were able to educate you during these two days. We hope you found the information helpful. Thank you. And we'll have our final video from our sponsor. When I think back on the last 25 years for the company, the learnings are deep and somewhat profound. We've done it our way. This is a hard business, but it's a really great business to be in when you've got the right team and the right mindset to go off and really attack some of the hardest problems in biomedical research. I think for most of us, when we start a company in the biomedical space, the objective is fairly narrow. We just want to solve a scientific problem Hopefully, the solution to that problem may lead to a drug. From everything from access to government affairs to all touch points in the organization, the patient is at the focus. Patients aren't only front and center in what we do, but Exelixis also works with a variety of patient advocacy organizations who work with us to create a united front in good public health policy. As every aspect of the organization evolves, how do we have the vision to create the next wave of clinical studies that will help address those patients' needs, even as better therapies come onto the market? Thank you all again.